Hello, today we're going to be talking about ancient weapons and Jonathan is going to present different weaponry. Um, in particular, he's going to focus on uh, Viking weapons. He's going to talk about weapons used in ancient worlds. And um, as we know, for example, the compound um, uh, uh, bow was used by Genghis Khan and he conquered uh, half of the known world with it, except the Western world. And um, that's basically uh, is how a weapon is so important um, in ancient times. Hi, Jonathan, how are you? John, Jonathan, can you hear me? I was <laughs> I'm muted, there we go, is that better? How are you, my friend? Great, man, how are you? Good. How's your program going? Um, Very well. Oh, thank you. Thank God. Very well so far. I'm glad. How about you? Has life been good? Yeah, life is good. Uh, so you said you have kids, right? You have. Uh, yeah, oh yes, I do have three kids. Oh, three! Wow, I have yes. only two, and I'm already screaming. With mine is <laughs> mine's in college, and one is 16. How old are your kids? I have mine are much younger. I have a one who will be seven next week, and a four-year-old, and an almost two-year-old. Wow, that's handful, man. Wow. Yes, that but you you were you know you've raised yours pretty much, so there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mine is mine. Just announced to me that she's uh, she's gonna be actually staying at uh, Pittsburgh. That's where she goes to school. Okay. Doing her MD. Uh, you know. Oh she, wow. Yeah, I mean, I did something right in life. You know, <laughs> my son <laughs> yes. was MD too, but he's only sixteen. Doesn't know what he wants. Okay. Yeah. What, what sort of what sort of medicine does she want to do? Uh, she wants to be a pediatrician, you know, um, because my nephew is like a family thing. Yeah. My nephew is a pediatrician, so he opened a business and she wants to work with him and stuff like that. So very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right. Uh, got Joe Joyce here, Stephanie. Uh, so you you know uh, you could uh, present whatever you like. I let you you know. I okay. Option. So I, just in case you don't know, 
uh, Sergio, our friend, was yes. presenting last Sunday. And he did what? He was presenting last Sunday yes. on History of Atsekas. And some guy uh, basically barged in our Zoom and he was posting hateful uh, annotations saying all these things, anti-Semitic, uh, racist things. Yikes. We had to stop the presentation. So I, I, I put some security measures in. Good. But um, I don't think it's ever going to happen because we have two more after that, and uh, yeah, that that kind of prevented. But it was it was you know, we had to stop the presentation. I'm sorry that happened. Yeah, 30 people. Yeah. So um, and yeah, go ahead. Um, so I don't know. People in Stephanie's here. How are you, Stephanie? Um, Joe is. Yeah, busy. just just let folks in as they come, and we'll get started hey, once yeah, everybody's sure. here. I want, you know, if, if you don't mind, I, I'll just present the schedule pretty quickly. Yeah, sure. No, go ahead. Take your time. Yeah. People are getting in. I'll just uh, kind of like go through schedule a little bit. Yeah, I mean, not, sure. nothing invasive, just, you know. No, you, By the way, I mean, take, take your time. This will be fine. Did you thank your wife for me, please, for the fact yes. that she's going to be presenting? <laughs> yes, I will. I said it in the group and everybody was so excited. Was like, <laughs> no way. We, we love this topic. And Excellent. I was like, okay, well, that, that's, you know. I didn't have to put it for polls because people were like medieval music. That's it. And I knew it would be a big hit. I, I knew right away. Well, I'm very glad. Yeah, no, she's. Um, as people are gonna get in, I'm just gonna give it five minutes schedule. And also throughout the uh, presentation, I have a couple of polls that I wanted to run. Any polls that you want to run, I can put it in it quickly if you need. Uh, but uh, I just you know wanted to see. You know what engage if people are interested yeah, sure please things. go ahead you 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 do whatever you need to do it won't bother me at, in the slightest no problem <clears throat> but i i appreciate it and i also told uh, people that uh you know today you know could be an intermix with medieval world weaponry with ancient weaponry so it's a it's a combination so hi paul how are you good zach good to see you good to see you as well Hello, everybody. Hello, Paul. How are you? All our regulars are here. Today, we're expecting over 20 people, maybe more. Okay. We'll uh, just wait till they arrive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. So today's polls I wanted to present is, you know, one poll. Uh, I want to, you know, restart our, <laughs> we used to go history and food. We used to go throughout different restaurants and try different food while talking a little bit of history. So far, we only did two because the COVID hit us, you know? That so shut we, everything down. Yeah, we did the uh, Uzbekistani yeah. restaurant and we did the Marani Jordan restaurant. And, um, you know, so I want to restart that. A second one I wanted to do is last time, a week ago, we did a wine presentation. It seemed like a lot of people enjoyed it. And I was just, you know, just throw it out there. Like if people are interested in like traveling together, maybe like Napa Wally, to try, you know, taste, you know, wine together, or I know it's difficult and stuff, but people are getting shots right now. So, and then we're tired of sitting at home, you know, <laughs> maybe people are interested in, you know, maybe it's a crazy idea and I'll just throw it out of the window to see, take a poll to see how, you know, also I want to see what the gauge on how people think about this group, what the improvements I could make. And, um, you know, if they want to, and also if they want to present as well, um you know different topics because some people may feel different things about different topics and stuff we have very good topics i mean we we just created all this i don't know john how do you feel about roman history do you like i, I don't know as much about it as i would like but it is very interesting yeah we so we up until the end of the year on our saturdays we're going to be we're going to be starting out rome starting with ramus and you know romulus uh and then going to the uh you know all the way all the way up to augustus you know <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna talk about you know uh patricians and plebeians you know all that beautiful stuff i mean that's something that uh paul had um wanted me to put on schedule which i did right. yeah, yeah i think it's just that's just the first you know the first leg that gets us up to augustus and then uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll go through the empire yeah i i, I really am uh, happy about uh the how we progress in our group, you know, we do ancient literature, which, you know, introduces people to literature. Now we're going to do medieval music. So, you know, hopefully at some point we'll do ancient music too. Who knows? Yes. The Greeks have, at least the Greeks have ancient music. 
right you know they, they had a what is it called an organ or whatever they uh i forget the name of it arfa sorry <laughs> it just came <laughs> right right because it's you always and then even um you know i recently did the you know uh on egypt and you know they something's called sistress it's like a, it looks like a you know a little you know baby toy but in egypt they used it to propel the uh uh you know for women to give birth it was like kind of like their um thing you know stuff you know it's called sister sisters mm -hmm. people they use different musical instruments and I, i'm sure they're you know people think of egyptians as being very you know like dog you know you know book of no they were actually very happy go around crowd you know they enjoyed their life you know and then when they die they knew how to die you know? <laughs> All right, so far we have eight people. Hi, Jane, how are you? Jane, those are messages all from me. I apologize, you know, I know you said that I'm afraid, to, you know, to press on it, otherwise I'll be uh, in trouble. Those are my, my messages. You're on mute, but sorry, right. I can understand it. I can read lip, lips, no problem. What did she say? Oh, she just said that it's okay, no problem. <laughs> I can trust it however I want you. You can't hear it anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I was calling your bluff. <laughs> All right. Let me just announce to people we're alive. You know, let me just start with the schedule, and as people come in, I will just uh, introduce them. So, uh, Paul did yesterday an amazing presentation on what does it mean to be Greek. The reason I have it on the schedule. I posted it on the YouTube and you guys can watch it on YouTube. Um, also, if you go to omnicarta.org, you can directly access it or you can go to YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, then uh, we're doing Hellenistic 2. Um, Marika is gonna talk about philosophy. I wanna talk about Bactrian king, kingdoms of Greek, you know, Greek influence in Bactria. That, that's interesting to me. And I'll talk to, you know, what Hadrian wants to talk about. Then we're going to go a little bit in Africa. We're going to do ancient kingdom of Nubia, mm -hmm. um, particularly two cities. I want to be concentrated as, you know, or two kingdoms uh, focused in Nabata and Arroyo. So they were, you know, interesting kingdoms. Uh, one was in, uh, you know, middle kingdom of Egypt and one was toward the end of the new kingdom uh, of Egypt, just to give you orientation. Right? They were like around fifth cataract of, of the Egypt. Then we're going to get into a little bit of Roman, but prior to Roman, we can't forget Etruscans, right? They were the ones that created the uh, the gladiator fighting. You know, even though it wasn't used for crowds, it was used for mostly cemetery or commemorative type of fighting. Uh, then Greg is going to jump into Ethiopia, Axum. Even Axum is a, more like a medieval kingdom, but still, you know, Ethiopia. And I'm going to start on Rome and starting with Romulus Rom. Uh, Romulus uh, Ramus. Uh, then in our modern piece, um, you know, last time we were rudely interrupted and we're going to, you know, redo uh, Rise and Falls of Atsekas. Um, then Rich, you know, is going to talk about Israeli wars, 11 wars, you know, uh, from Maccabees Revolt all the way to uh, 1973 war. Um, then I moved the stateless ethnicity to 5-2. Should be interesting, you know, people like, for example, Kurds, they don't have their state. So we're gonna talk about countries that live, you know, outside of, you know, don't have their own state, but they're a pretty big ethnic group. Then, um, you know, Greg is gonna do Plato Apology of Socrates. We already have 22 people signed up. So it'll be interesting one on 324. And then next month we'll do a Plutarch Alcibiades. Um, should be an interesting one too. Joshua, who wrote a book on Relationship of Vikings versus Al Andalus, modern relationship with Vikings is going to present on 331. He wrote a book with Mohammed. Uh, they're going to present both sides and they're going to promote their book as well. So, you know, if you guys want to show up on that one. Um, today we have Jonathan presenting history of ancient weaponry. And not, not to forget, but Jonathan's wife on 516, right after the conquest of Americas, a little switch gears, she's going to present music in medieval time. On, on 516 so it should be really interesting one and uh, 
Jonathan, your wife is the PhD, right? The musical. Yeah, she's a musicologist. So she, uh, music is, is her life. Right. I have an undergrad degree in music, but um, she's the one who, she went on and pursued the, 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 the end goal there. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, we'll hear that. And maybe you know, there's going to be a concerto a little bit, you know, just to, you know, watch some YouTube videos of how it would have sounded. Um, and then, you know, uh, Mark is going to do, and again, I misspelled Mark. I apologize. It's MRC, MRC, C at the end. Uh, he's going to do Friends of 1940. Oh, um, he's going to do Friends of 1940. So as we know what happened, you know, 1940, you know, the whole Maginot system, you know, broken by Germans and get through. Um, then we will have a little switch of gears. We're going to history of American cop, racist sailing, and is going to do that. And then um, I'm going to finish off with a sports, you know, sportscaster, history of uh, FIFA, you know, it's just the, you know, football federation, 1924, 2018 world cups. On 4-1, we're going to do Dutch East India company. You know, we know that they were prevalent in, you know, slave trading and all that stuff. So Anna's going to present that. Paul's going to talk about on 4-8, the history of mining and metallurgy. Um, we have a history of gunpowder. I'll probably present, but if anybody wants to help me, 4-15. And then we have two more exciting presentations, how Aristotle got to the Western world and Amarna period of Egypt. People are still you know, getting through it, Jonathan, so I'm still talking. Let's just to get... oh, go ahead, Zach, take your time. Yes. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, so I want to start kind of like at least start talking about uh, travel club and a dinner club, you know, not the credit card. <laughs> we want to we want to resume our, you know, uh, lunches or dinners because people are getting shots right now and restaurants are still pretty kind of, you know, not full. We can, you know, restart our ethnic, you know, food tasting like Georgian restaurant, Uzbekistan restaurant, Persian restaurant. Greek restaurant and talk a little bit about history. So I just wanted to, today I'm gonna to do a poll maybe um, in the beginning or whatever. And then at some point uh, I wanna start a travel club where people are gonna travel, you know, to Napa Valley to wine tasting, you know, or they, for example, want to go to um, check out pyramids in Mexico, you know, and then maybe eight to 10 of us can go, you know, somewhere uh, when things are open up. So uh, the dinner club maybe starts somewhere in May and the travel club is kind of open. I don't know yet. So I'm going to present the poll today. So yeah. we'll stop sharing now. And then I'm going to let Jonathan share. There's about 13 people on. And I'm going to put myself on mute for now. Great. Thank you. I'll go ahead and uh, share the screen. And then we'll just kind of dive in here. Can everybody, um, we'll, we'll see as this kind of comes up, it'll take one second. All right, can everybody see okay? Yes. Great, so kind of, um, you know, kind of looking where we are now, um, this, is, this is a presentation on arms and armor of the medieval period, and so, um, in the ancient world, you do have weapons that are very similar. Some of the weapons that we're using in the medieval period haven't changed since antiquity. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. But essentially, as we kind of jump in, um, you know, we want to we want to talk about um, the literally the tools that shaped the world. Uh, when we look at um, where we where we are now in history, uh, we look back over time and, and usually the two biggest driving factors um, that, that, that pull civilization forward are economic matters and then matters of war. And so, and again, that's very generally speaking, that's very, very broad thing. But um, where we're, what we're going to kind of look at is, uh, is the medieval period, the Middle Ages, what we talk about in arms and armor, particularly of Western Europe. Um, you share some things in common, um, even at this time with places like the Middle East, Syria, Persia, uh, maybe even as far east as India. Um, there was even um, a 13th century uh, Frenchman who, on his effigy, some um, archaeologists believe that his sword shows a very Chinese influence, um, almost that he would have picked this sword up. His name is John Dalyu. Um, 
and they don't know whether he picked this sword up in China, whether it uh, was something that kind of came across the Silk Road trade routes and it was picked up in the Middle East. Um, but just very interesting things. So we'll talk a little bit about some of this as we go forward. Um, as we get started, uh, uh, definitely a word of thanks to um, a couple of friends of mine, some guys, Joe Metz, Ian Lespina, Andrew Dangle, uh, Johan Kyle, uh, and Naomi Wilson. They've given me access to some to some photographs, and this is going to be a very photographic intensive presentation. There's some text, um, but rather than just talk about the stuff, we need to look at it. We need to conceive of what it looks like, what it does, how it works. So um, ideally, this would be something that I could give to you in person, where I could you know, bring lots of things to pass around, and you could see them and touch them with your hands and, and look and see with your eyes how they move. Um, but this, you know, considering where we are in the world with COVID, this is a, a second best. So I want to give many thanks to, um, to these folks who very kindly shared permission for some images. So as we jump in, a quick overview. One thing I want to point out and to keep in mind is that the medieval period is a really long time. That's a thousand years. Okay, that's something that's really, uh, really kind of important to, to pay attention to. And I'll jump out really quick. The background here that we see this as who has been to the Met uh, in New York, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In, I, going uh, into the kind of arms and armor collection, have you seen these statues? This is the Met. Okay, we are closer. To, we. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry, John. I, I said only a thousand times. That only a thousand that, times, that, right? That particular. <laughs> and it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful setup. It's one that everybody knows. Um, this is when people think of the medieval period, this is what a lot of people picture. This is a lot of what they think about. But one of the things that I want to point out is that we are actually closer to these guys right now than they were to Hastings when they were alive. That's, that's, that's how long we're talking about here with the medieval period. It is a thousand year period of history. So when we're talking about this, um, the first, especially the first 500 or so years, things don't change a ton. So we'll be able to kind of cover them with more sweeping statements, more broad generalizations, at least in terms of arms and armor. Of course, cultural change was, was vast. Um, economic change, maybe, maybe less vast than cultural change, but, but still uh, more so than what we would find in, in terms of war. But we're talking about a very long period of time. So we're kind of, we're going to kind of break these uh, break these up. We're going to talk about the Viking Age. This is eight, 800 to 1050. Um, much before the Viking Age, you have, you have way too many fragmented periods and tribes. Um, and the, the Angles and the Saxons and the Danes and the Jutes and uh, the Franks and all of these other periods, or sorry, all of these other people groups within that period, which are in some ways are similar, but in other ways are very different. And so it's kind of hard. They would deserve maybe a topic of their own. So we're going to kind of start around 800, the Viking Age, uh, which, you know, most historians will tell you somewhere around 800 to 1050. And again, these dates are not perfect. They're flexible. Um, some people might argue with a, you know, 25 to 50 year transition in between some of these places, especially depending on geography. So uh, Viking Age, about 800 to 1050. Uh, we launch into the High Middle Ages around 1050 to 1300 and the Late Middle Ages from 1300 to 1500. Um, by the time we get to 1500, that's the end of the late Middle Ages in England, but Italy's been in the Renaissance already for somewhere around 50 years or maybe a little bit more, um, depending on which historians you read and what you see. So just want to be sure that, I, you know, I'm not making uh, concrete statements here about things being set in stone. There's some flexibility here. Also, just as a reminder, I'm not a historian. I'm just an enthusiast with uh, a drive to read and learn more. And so um, in my in my interest and, and opportunity to do that, this is where we are. So um, one of the things too that's really important to recognize when we talk about arms and armor is that geography is a major factor in determining what was present where. Part of that is styles of fighting and part of that is because of geography. Um, you know, the Italian uh, city-states in the north in the very mountainous regions of Italy are actually quite different. They're much more closer to Germany and German culture of, in this time period than they are to the, the southern Italian states around, you know, the papal states in Rome and, and even further south, um, you know, down into in places like Sicily. So very different there. Um, what you get in France may be very different than what you get in the low countries in the late Middle Ages. So um, geography plays a major factor in, in the type of fighting that's done and by extension, the kind of armor and arms that are used to do that fighting. 
So one of the things too that we need to talk about is we're talking again about Western Europe, regional flair is seen more and more as we move into the later Middle Ages, where you might be able to say this suit of armor we know was made in Milan, not because we have the, the armorer's stamp on there that says, you know, who made it, but also because of, of the style. You get these big heavy plate gauntlets that are mittens almost, like, like bear paw mittens. That's a Milanese style or trait out of Northern Italy. Uh, you know, whereas the English style in that time, um, you know, the, the pauldrons for your shoulders are very different. So there's bits and pieces of flair that we see as we get further and further into the late Middle Ages. And so in this presentation, uh, what you're going to see, you're going to see period imagery and textual descriptions. So where possible, I've used, um, I've used primary source descriptions as a way to kind of lay out and talk about what they were seeing at their own time. We make use of extant examples where possible, uh, be like things that are in museums, things that have been dug, excuse me, dug out of the ground or held in private collection for years and, and put into museums because those are surviving examples that were there at the time period. So we wanna use those where we can. Um, also, there are some, um, there's some smiths and armorers out there that are amazing at what their ability to achieve. And they go to the museums and they take exacting measurements and they produce um, you know, they produce, you know, replicas and examples like right down to, to the exact specifications within micrograms of weight. Um, pretty impressive what they're able to do. So we make use of those uh, in this presentation as well. And then, of course, modern approximations of medieval use where we'll see um, high quality reenactors in some images who are, uh, who are trying to recreate a scene as much as we can. Uh, close to the original. So some general info to get started. Um, it's not going to be a surprise to anybody that technology advances across the age, allowing for better extraction and use of materials. So one of the things that we see early on, we don't see heavy plate right away um, in the early Middle Ages because we don't have the technology present um, to be able to extract the amount of metal that we need, the type of metal that we need, um, you know, the, the blast furnace that, that comes later in the Middle Ages is a technology that revolutionizes how armor is made and, and what armors are able to do with that. So um, you begin to see armor advance, you begin to see weapons advance as technology advances. And these two things are symbiotic. Um, you know, when you have intense conflict, you have one side that then goes into, um, into a research phase. How can we overcome this weapon or this type of armor and we create something new. And then so they take a stair step up and then another side or another enemy comes in and says, how can we overcome this? And they take a stair step up. And so it's very, it's very interesting. You can kind of watch in the pictures, you'll see this kind of progression happening as we move along, especially um, from the high middle ages into the late middle ages. And just as a reminder, if you have questions or things you want to, um, you know, want to interject as we're going, just interrupt me, jump in um, and share what you have for sure. So um, as I just described, this is a literal arms race. We hear the term arms race all the time. When we're talking about this topic, it's literal. This is exactly what it is. Um, it, is it is arms and armor, it is weaponry, it is, um, it is protection, back and forth, back and forth as we move across the age. So general trends that we'll notice as we move um, from the Viking age all the way into the late middle ages is we see a general trend of less armor in the beginning toward more armor um, later on in the period. And this seems to be true regardless of your status, whether you're somebody that is ultra rich and can afford whatever you want, or whether you are a common soldier. Um, part of this is because armor becomes more affordable. Um, and so that is, that's one of the big motivators and, and reasons. Um, the Black Death also has a lot to do with this and its shift in the economy and how labor, uh, money for labor was, was increased after this period. I can't get into all of that, obviously, because that's a topic that's all its own. But um, we begin to see this trend from less toward more. Weapons move from those favored for unarmored opponents or less armored opponents toward those for, uh, for combat with armored opponents. So again, this arms race back and forth. So one of the, the big questions that I always get from folks when I do something like this is how do we know what was used? And how do we know how it was used? Um, and one of the first answers that I'll give you is it's sometimes hard to ascertain how, how each individual item was used um, in its own context. We can get a pretty good idea, but we don't always know. And there are some things that, that we're not sure um, exactly what they are. For example, within the past, I think about 15 years, there have been 
a lot of finds of um, small uh, diamond shaped circular triangular pieces of leather come out of York in England um, toward the late Viking age, moving into the high middle ages. And for a long time, people couldn't figure out what they were. Are they parts of old shoes? Are they parts of purses? Um, somebody's come forward now and said they think that they're, they're sling pouches. Um, they think that these were weaponized pieces of, of equipment. These were literally pouches for slingers to, um, to use. So we don't always know. There's not always great agreement in the community about how this was used or how it wasn't. Um, but usually you can get some fairly good clues about, about the general use. Um, we also have extant examples so that we know, we actually see the tools themselves. We can find the marks that are on them for how they were used. Um, and we get, to, we get to kind of glimpse where there's more wear and tear on this piece of equipment. Um, even down to the degree that like archeologists can sample, you know, microscopic scrapings off of a wooden half that survived. And they can tell where, where hand, from grease on your, hand, on your hands. They can tell where hands spent most of their time on this piece of wood. So it's very interesting. And um, we also have manuscript images, which show us scenes. We have to be sometimes pretty careful about how we interpret manuscript um, depictions. But manuscript images are helpful. Um, we have effigies, which are kind of our burial statues that give us uh, a clue or an indicator about um, the type of things that people were wearing or what they thought were important. Architecture like stained glass and statuary become important. And then of course we have written descriptions. So kind of a closer look up here. Some of this stuff is gonna be more high res than others. I tried to get as much high res stuff as I could. But here on the top left, you'll see a manuscript uh, from the high middle ages. This is probably late 13th century, maybe very early 14th century. And you get to see a type of sword. Um, that type of sword, you can tell from the look of it, um, especially based, and you don't have this, but in this other, in this manuscript, there are other images which show different types of swords. So we know that this sword, unless it was just an accident, this sword is a type of blade that's designed for thrusting. Um, because as armor becomes more prevalent, swords become more important um, to exploit gaps in armor. You, you're not cutting on unarmored opponents, so the cut becomes less important than the thrust. And if you look over to the far right, you'll see a sword that can that is designed for both cut and thrust, but you'll notice it has a very similar shape to it. So sometimes something that's very interesting is to find an extant example or to find a manuscript image or a piece in statuary and to try to find where these um, you know, where these, these, type, these other types of equipment match up and, and measure up. Um, here in the middle is an effigy. Uh, this is a knight's effigy. Uh, you can tell by the shield that he carries that this is somebody, again, from the late 13th century to the early 14th century. Um, you also see the sword belt that he's wearing. If you can see my mouse right here, you'll notice this is not a buckle closure. This is a tie closure. Um, the tie closure is common in uh, all parts of Western Europe in the, um, in the early uh, Middle Ages and toward the beginning of the High Middle Ages. It stopped being popular um, except in Germany, once you get to about the middle of the 13th century. So um, you can kind of see some of these small details that play out. You see he's all in mail. He doesn't have any plate. He's wearing spurs. He's clearly a knight. He's meant to be, um, he's meant to be someone who's, a, a, you know, representing the knightly status. Also, just between, you know, what we know about the records and how these things go, if this person is wealthy enough to have an effigy made for them, they're going to be someone of the upper class. Uh, here in the bottom left, you can see two statues of the founders of Nomburg Cathedral. And you, you see they still bear some of their original polychromy, um, some of the original paint um, from, from when they were constructed. And so you get a sense, you get shields and you get swords, at least not, not for, uh, not for the, the, the female here, Uda, um, but for the gentleman here on the left, uh, Eckhard, you can see that his sword belt has a tie closure. You can see that it's wrapped around here because he's not really wearing it around his waist right now. You see he's got the triangular shield that's popular in the early 13th century. So we begin to see some of these details in manuscript and excellent examples, effigies, statuary, stained glass. This is clearly an example from the 15th century, maybe very late 14th century. Question, Jonathan? Yes, sir, please. Is the effigy a royal? He seems to be wearing a crown. Um, I don't think it's a royal effigy. Uh, actually, I know this is not a royal effigy. I can't remember the last name right now, um, but it, is, it, it was somebody, it's, this is a Frenchman of, of high status, I believe a Duke or the, the French equivalent of the Duke. Um, so he would have been considered part of the royal court, but not necessarily the royal himself. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I'm surprised that he wears a crown if he's not a royal. Correct. Um, you get into some of that. 
Um, and you know, Paul, I would have to look this up more closely. It may be, um, it may be that he was in the Royal line and may, yeah. and may have, you know, may have been second or third in line. I would have to, I, I wish I'd written down and put this in here, but um, if you're interested, I can look that up and get in touch with you later for sure. Um, but the stained glass here, sometimes you have to be careful with stained glass, especially once we get into the Victorian period where restorers come in and do work that um, might not have been um, exactly in line with what the originals were. This is an original piece of stained glass from Chartres Cathedral. Um, uh, part of, no, I'm sorry, not Chartres. Chartres is the 13th century. This is from um, Notre Dame, one of the Notre Dames in Northern France. Um, but you'll see you'll see that he's got on full plate. So this tells us immediately we're, you know, we're a hundred years or more removed from many of these folks over here. So this is how we kind of understand what was used based on the time period. We have good dates for these things because we know when these people live, we have written records. They talk about battles or they talk about political events or economic events uh, or plagues or things of that nature where we know what year it is. Also, many of them will give us dates um, when, when writing. So, um, as we're kind of moving forward, some of the general uh, info we want to talk about with weapons is weapons are, of course, designed to kill your enemy. Uh, that's their sole purpose, is to give you the advantage to, to eliminate the threat on the battlefield to you. And we have a different weapons that are used across the age and for different purposes. This is probably pretty self-explanatory, but I want to be sure that we cover it just to be sure that we understand the context. Spears, something that had been around, probably literally the first weapon was a spear. Uh, a sharpened stick of some kind, uh, later hardened in the fire, um, and then we move on to the, to the Middle Ages, where we have uh, where we have spears as still being the most common weapon. Um, one of the earliest records that we have of a requirement for arms and armor is the English Assize of Arms in 1181, and it requires that every single fighter have a lance. Now, in the Middle Ages, lance and spear in some of these documents are used interchangeably, and depending on your status, you just kind of read into that which is which. A lance is, most people think, is very much like a spear, but just much longer. We're not talking about the tournament lances that we think of, you know, with the decoration and the big flared handles and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, just a, just a simple uh, stick with, a, with a, you know, a hardened metal point on the end that's meant to drive through an enemy. So it's very helpful to you when you're on horseback because you can run somebody down with it. And when you are on the ground, it keeps the enemy at length. Um, it's very effective against unarmored opponents, even to the fact that when you get into the 16th century um, and some of these professional fighters are writing fight manuals. Um, I've got one behind me here. You can kind of see Hans Tallhofer's Medieval Combat is a fighting manual about how to, how to fight with different weapons. Many of these guys will say that a man with a spear against men with swords, he has the advantage even at two to one. A man with a spear has an advantage over two swordsmen. So spears are great at keeping your enemy at length and are good for unarmored opponents. Um, as the Middle Ages move on, you, you end up with pole arms, and you have some of these in the Viking Age. Some of the longer hafted axes uh, would probably fall into a pole arm category. They also keep the enemy at length, and there are various options for them against various opponents, which we'll kind of get into more detail about later. Swords, one thing I always want to point out, um, almost always swords are a sidearm. I can't say always because I hate to say always or never, but they are almost always a sidearm. Until you get into the very late Middle Ages, um, the sword is not, and even then, not many folks, it is not your primary weapon. It is on your hip, and it is ready for you when you, when you need it. Um, it's excellent against unarmored opponents, of course. Blunt and impact weapons are dealt for dealing crushing blows, um, and they can deal crushing blows to people in armor or without armor. So mm -hmm. even if you're wearing heavy armor, if I have the right weapon, I don't care about your armor. I'll break the bones beneath your armor. Um, you, you, know, you, can, you can have great protection um, and your armor should be designed to glance off blows as much as possible. But if I have a type of mace or an ax or a hammer of some kind and I land the right shot, I'll deform your armor and break your arm or your ribs um, or something else to where Jonathan, you are as as you could be. Jonathan? Yes. So I have a question that yes, please. I always had. Uh, were there uh, the armors, was recyclable? I mean, you kill the opponent, the, the opponent is dead, everybody leaves. Do you take the armor from the enemy and can you recycle and do something to that? Or takes forever to take it out of the body? How, how does it work? 
Yes and no. Um, we have several accounts of battlefield looting that happens where once the battle is over, people are going out and taking equipment off of dead bodies. If you've ever seen the Bayou Tapestry, uh, there's a great example of this illustrated in the Bayou Tapestry where, uh, where bodies are laying out on the field and the victorious Normans go out and pull the male shirts um, off of their Anglo-Saxon counterparts. So if the, if the armor is salvageable, yes. Um, you might be able to resell it to, to folks who work metal or who, who might um, try to, maybe somebody of lower class might end up with some of this and try to work in different pieces. It's hard to say um, how much that was done because armor at this point specifically was tailor-made to every individual. Right. Um, it, we're going to talk about that in just a second, but it needs to fit your body. It needs to work. Okay. So, you had I was, was going to say, uh, well, well, in the case of arrows, there there are some um, um, accounts where they would send, you know, um, scouts out to retrieve arrows that were still efficient and well to be used. So, yeah, they did recycle some of the stuff because that stuff costs money. Yeah. And, you know, they would definitely, if it still worked, it was worth using, they would definitely, you know, yes. put it to use. Mm -hmm. I can't say, I'm sorry, I can't say how much uh, or how yeah. long that practice was, but it is known. It is known to have happened. And is recorded in several places. As a matter of fact, um, in 1361, the Battle of Visby, uh, we have we know so much about what arms and armor were like in the Germanic world in the 1360s and, and a little bit before because of the Battle of Visby. Um, so many of the Gotlanders um, are on Gotland, the, the Swedish island there, were buried in their armor because this was a summer battle and the bodies began to decompose on the battlefield. And so in order to try to avoid plague, the bodies were not looted. So it's actually very interesting that um, this probably was a fairly common practice. Again, I don't want to say how often, but I, you know, I, can't, I can't speak to that. Maybe, maybe a historian in some way could. But I think it's interesting that um, once you get out of the Viking Age, you don't have a lot of burials in armor. Um, God, uh, Bisbee on Gotland was, was a unique situation to that. And so maybe that kind of speaks to some of that as well. Can I add something, Jonathan? Yes, um, please do. What you were saying about the first weapon, um, yeah, most likely it would have been the spear, but at the same time, the spear, like the bow and arrow and a lot of sharp objects, they would have also been tools that they used yeah. for hunting. So right. what I read in this uh, interesting re read, the first official weapon, when we mean weapon, meaning a, a tool of war, would have been the mace, um, going back to ancient times, because that weapon is strictly That's used right. for war. A purposeful, a, a purposeful tool for war, not for. That's right. Action. That's right. Because an axe, you yes, they had battle axes, yes. but you also use an axe to chop down wood. Oh, yes, yes, so. and there there are many there are many cases where uh, you know where you might look and see that that uh, poor folks or common folks called to war um, might come with a specific weapon, but they might also come with something that is a tool that they use in other areas mm -hmm. of life um, that could be a weapon. So thank you, Sergio. Excellent for pointing that out. Um, so blunt and impact weapons become important and become, they're always present, but they become more important as armor becomes more prevalent, especially plate armor. Uh, ranged weapons have been around for a long, long time and they continue to be around. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit. And also daggers, um, daggers in various forms, excuse me, or fighting knives have been around for quite a while too and, and are present across the age, just in different forms. So um, your, uh, your weapons are meant to overpower your enemy's armor, of course, and one thing that I think isn't really talked about enough is the psychological factor or the psychological blow that comes from, um, from war of this kind, and particularly from somebody else trying to hurt you or kill you. Um, war in, in any of its facets is a difficult thing and, and in many ways is a terrible thing. Um, and in the Middle Ages, and we still have this some today, I would argue, you know, uh, drastically less so, but it, it's still there uh, some. But in the Middle Ages, killing was up close and personal um, for most folks. Death was a very present thing. And so um, there's a psychological blow. And I, I use a quote here from Gerald of Wales about um, Irishmen who carried, who carried staff axes or, or taller axes. Um, that would have, been, uh, would have been common in Ireland at that time. In 1185, here's what he says. The Irish always carry an axe in their hand as if it were a staff. This weapon has not to be raised like a sword or bent as a bow or poised as a spear without further, further excuse me, without further preparation beyond, uh, I can't see behind here, beyond being raised a little, 
uh, it inflicts a mortal blow from the axe. There is always anxiety. If you are think if you think you are free from anxiety, you are not free from an axe. And so the fact that he, uh, this was something that he worked in. I, when I first read that, I chuckled to myself a little bit and just thought, man, like he must have had some really bad experiences with uh, with Irishmen wielding axes. Um, and then Gerald of Wales um, also recounts in this in this same work about how um, how one of the English knights, and I misspelled knight, my goodness, uh, one of the English K-N-I-G-H-T's on horseback, even though he was wearing male chausses or leggings, had his leg cut completely through um, by one of these axes. So he, he lost a leg in this, uh, in this encounter. Welsh longbows in 1188 pinned one English knight to his saddle. So uh, he was wheeling his horse around and he was shot through the thigh again and it pinned him to the wood of his saddle. And when wheeling his horse around in, another, in the other direction, another arrow came in. And so he had one arrow through each of his thighs pinning him to the saddle of his horse. And so this is a very psychological thing um, that you are always in danger. Even with armor, you are, you are never completely safe. Um, a knightly charge at Bouvines in 1214, which was, um, you know, the French army versus the allies of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, some uh, some Braven, Bravensan infantry, uh, English, a few Dutch, or at this time Flanders, uh, Flemish, Flemish forces um, were, were pitted against each other in this battle. And in 2014, a French knight um, in... Um, in the service of, I guess in the service of the king, was pinned to his saddle through his lower abdomen by an enemy's lance. Um, and Guillaume de Breton or William de Breton uh, tells us about this in his account at Bouvine. So there's always this fear that you are going to be, um, you're going to be hurt. So with those being the characteristics of uh, of weapons. Let's talk about some general characteristics of armor. It's not meant to make you impervious to damage. That is often a, that is probably the most common misperception that I find when we talk about these things is that it was never meant to make you impervious to damage. It is meant to keep you alive. Um, you still have to keep your wits about you. You still have to be a skilled combatant, um, but you need to be able to, um, you need to be able to rely on it to help save your life, but it, it's not going to keep you impervious from damage. Uh, going back to Bouvine, the Count of Bologna was pulled from his horse by some foot troops. And he, um, the, the quote here from William Breton, uh, this quote is hilarious. It says that the Count's noble parts were saved because he had good armor on. Um, apparently he had on what, what seemed to me to be padded cuisses, which are like quilted thigh garments that covered his groin and his, his upper thighs um, above his male leggings or chausses. So his noble parts were saved from the dagger of a common soldier because he had good armor. Uh, William Marshall is, is accounted at least twice, maybe three times, of having to have his helmet. Um, in, in the tournament, he was, a, he was a fierce fighter, often in the tournament, a great knight of renown. But he had to have the helmet removed from his head by armorers two or maybe three times because it was so smashed and bashed he actually couldn't get it off. Um, so this is meant to give you a, as much of a counter as possible to the enemy's weaponry and well-made stuff used well, fitted well, could give you, um, a significant counter to many of the weapons. Uh, it may not give you a counter to every weapon or even to every weapon in every situation, but it was meant again to try to keep you alive. Steel pieces were designed to deflect or turn blows. And then we also have padded garments that were common across the age, which are designed to absorb impact as much as possible. Something else about armor is it should fit. Uh, you have to maintain mobility. You have to be able to move. Uh, Bukikal here, was one of the most famous French knights, uh, William Le Mongre, um, in the, the late 13th, sorry, late uh, 14th, early 15th century, late 1300s, early 1400s, would run like two miles a day in his armor. That was something that he said that, that every knight should do. You should be fighting fit. You should put on your armor. And you should go for a run. So he was out training, running in, the, in his full plate armor all the time. Uh, wealthy men had armor that was tailor made, almost like we would have a fine suit made today. You would go to your armorer and he would measure you out um, and he would make something exactly to your measurements. And this is especially true of plate in the later years. Uh, it's thought, and again, this is a little bit of speculation. It's hard to know exactly, but it's thought that even less wealthy men would have somewhat of a tailored fit 
to their armor, if at all possible. So armor is also wearable for long periods of time. Some battles are over fairly quickly. Some battles are not. They last a long time. Some battles, um, even the ones that are over quickly, you might prepare for the day and go ahead and armor up, and you're in your armor for four, five, six hours before anything ever happens. So this is meant to be worn for long periods of time. Uh, full mail kit, so mail armor, a hauberk, mail leggings as we get into the 13th century. Um, the, full, the full kit uh, is somewhere around 45 pounds on average for most people. Now, I'm a fairly large person, so for somebody like me, the weight might be a little bit more. I have more body to cover, um, so I'm going to use more rings in my, in my armor. So it might be a little bit more for somebody like me, but on average, we're talking around 45 pounds. Even for me, what I have is tailored for me. Um, when I wear this. And so I spread the weight of this out over my entire body. I have belts that help to, uh, to, to take some of the weight off my shoulders and put it onto my hips. Um, so, you know, when I'm moving around and wearing it, I can feel it, but it doesn't, it doesn't exhaust you to no end after just a little bit of time. It is meant to be worn for long periods of time. Also, uh, men who are wearing full armor, especially uh, especially once we once we're in the kind of like the 13th century and on into the mid 14th century, a lot of these guys are on horseback for a, a lot of the time, so they're really not bearing a lot of that weight. Jonathan, uh, and yes. question: So you always need someone to help you to take it off and put it on? Most of the time, yes. Uh, especially for your your once you get into the later Middle Ages, more plate. Um, a knight has someone. He has a squire. He has. Uh, he has other men at arms that are in his retinue. Um, he doesn't clean his armor. He doesn't take care of it. He has a lot of people for that. And there's always somebody to help him get dressed and ready uh, because there are some pieces that he might be able to do by himself in a pinch, but it, we, it's, it is believed that that was not likely the case uh, most of the time. Does that answer your question? Great. Um, so full plate kit, once we get into the 15th century, is somewhere around 60 pounds. It's a little bit more weight. Um, but again, it's tailored for the wearer. It's spread over the entirety of the body. These men, a lot of them are on horseback. Once we get into the 15th century, there's more fighting on foot. We'll talk about that later. Um, but compared to the modern U.S. soldier, their kit is 80 pounds on average. Some of that is still armor. A Kevlar vest is worn to try to protect the body from ranged weapons like bullets, um, something that we've learned the hard way. Uh, is that um, is that Kevlar does not protect against bladed weapons. So um, you know, even even talking to um, even talking to folks uh, who have who have seen modern combat, um, many of them will carry a, a knife of some kind. Um, they'll carry. I've known several of my friends who've done uh, overseas tours of duty who carry uh, combat hatchets or axes because. Not only can they be used in a pinch to save your life, they're wonderful tools um, when you're out and about on patrol or in enemy territory. So um, our, modern, our modern guys still do some of this stuff and their weight is heavier now than it's ever been, at least in the US military tradition. And it's still more than what the medieval guys uh, were carrying on their bodies. One of the things that's important to recognize too is that lots of the weight for our modern US soldier is on his pack, it's in the backpack. So it's very concentrated, whereas for the medieval folks, it was spread out over the body. Um, so why do we need armor? And I think this is a this is a, should be a pretty self-explanatory uh, question, uh, and we're going to start jumping into some pictures here again in just a second. But um, I want to want to be sure that we hit it and hit it well. That battlefield injuries were often horrific. Um, I don't want to get into too much gruesome detail, but you know. Wounds on the battlefield from bladed weapons and from things like axes and hammers and spears are not, um, are not pleasant at all. Some of these wounds, depending on what kind of armor you had or what kind of blow you received, could be survivable, particularly if good treatment was available and it was available in a reasonable time frame. Um, most of what we hear about medieval physicians is that they, you know, they did medicine based on the, the four humors, which in some ways is true. But medicine could be very advanced in the Middle Ages, and we'll talk about, about that in just a second. Um, for many of those wounds that were not survivable, and many were not, um, and if you did not have good treatment, or even if you did have good treatment, if you got the right kind of wound, you were just not going to survive. Um, you know, the, the most common ways of death were exsanguination, where you're bleeding out from, from some sort of wound. Uh, infection might set in. 
from a wound that you've received and kill you over time. And sometimes the body is just hit so hard in such a way that the, the sheer trauma of that impact uh, is just not survivable for the body. So those are common ways that people die out on the field. Um, there is evidence of medical treatment for battlefield injuries, both in surviving accounts, um, also on skeletal remains. Um, and I think that's very interesting. Uh, things that were very common in the Middle Ages, tinctures and salves for wounds that were obtained in any method or, or form, uh, often, often used to heal wounds from the battlefield. There were primitive, primitive antibiotics. Um, I don't know if y'all have read about this or not, but there's, um, there's been some, uh, some cross-disciplinary research between microbiologists, chemists, pharmacists, historians recently uh, with, a, uh, with a recipe called Bald's Eye Salve, um, which was from, I think, the 10th century, maybe the 11th century. Um, but they uh, followed a medieval recipe, and they were able to find that this, this salve kills MRSA. MRSA is a very, it's a, it's a common, um, common antibiotic resistant infection right now in our modern era uh, that some folks get from the hospital. And there's only like maybe one or two known antibiotics that will kill MRSA. Bald's eye salve, uh, which is like a combination of a, a few different herbs and cow bile, and it has to be boiled in a copper pot. And there's a lot of different instructions, but when followed exactly in the lab, they've been able to see that it will kill MRSA, which was just fascinating, very interesting. But medieval medicine was advanced enough to where given the right uh, time frame and the right ingredients, um, tinctures and salves and antibiotics could make a difference. Um, primitive casts and slings were known, amputations, cauterizations, and surgeries were also known in the medieval period, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, I've included here some records of survived injuries. Leopold V, uh, he was an Austrian, and he, at the tournament at Graz in 1196, um, he was participating in the tournament, and his horse fell on his leg, and it was so badly broken that he knew it was not, uh, not ever going to be healed. And so he ordered his, um, he ordered his uh, squire, or excuse me, his chamberlain, um, to cut his leg off with an axe. So he uh, ordered an amputation for himself when, when he realized it was not going to happen. His doctors tried to save him, but he didn't have uh, adequate medical treatment at the time. So he survived for a while, but eventually did die within uh, probably a week or so from, the, from this incident in 1196. Henry V uh, of England at the Battle of Shrewsbury took an arrow to the face and survived. We'll talk more about that in just a second because I have some stuff to show you there. And then there are some unknown graves of unnamed folks in Germany from the crusading era. Uh, there were 30 of them in this particular churchyard that showed head trauma and 23 of them survived significant head trauma. Uh, they had bone growth in the skull and a few of them even showed trepanation where a medieval surgeon had drilled a hole in the skull to relieve swelling and pressure of the brain and they survived. So in, in this one particular courtyard, uh, or graveyard, we have, we have 23 graves that showed folks had survived from pretty significant head injuries, which I thought was interesting. So how let's do look we at know that they survived? I'm sorry, how I mean, do we know they survived? Yeah. Because archaeologists can look at the bones and tell that new, new growth had happened. They can, see, they can see scarring in the bones and saw that new bone had grown over that area. Okay. As opposed Thank to you. these things that we're looking now, where it's clear that no new growth was possible. Um, looking up here on the top left, if this is a little bit grainy, but you can kind of see an indentation here in this bone. Uh, this is a humerus bone on the upper arm, and that is actually believed to be a ring of mail. So someone was hit so hard um, that a, a particular ring of mail uh, burst through the soft tissue and chipped away that part of the bone. Uh, here on the right, up top, you'll see the upper part of a tibia. Uh, so just below the knee, this is the rear part of the bone, and this was an arrow wound. And the arrow hit with enough force to go through the calf in the back of the leg and to punch a hole in that bone. And I thought it was very interesting that you can see the splintering of that bone lengthwise right along that impact area. So that hit with quite a bit of impact. Um, and this was a, a reason we don't know what kind of armor this individual had on by the look of the wound. It probably seems like he didn't have much or any. So this was part of the need for armor. Right here in the middle, this is believed to be a sword cut right across the face. 
Um, so perhaps no helmet was on uh, or perhaps uh, an open-faced helmet was on and this is the kind of wound that you receive. Um, the skull here to the right is another arrow wound to the head, presumably with no head protection. Uh, down here to the left around this eye socket, that's believed to be the wound from a pole axe, which is a, a later uh, weapon, of the, a weapon of the later Middle Ages. Uh, oftentimes that had um, an axe blade on one side and either a spike or a hammer face on the other side. You can see the blunt trauma um, that's just caved in this entire side of the, the skull right here. Uh, again, so reasons that you want to wear armor. Here in the center, this is believed to be an axe blow to the front of the face, and you can see it was significant enough to where it cut and then split the skull laterally um, across the back. There was so much pressure that it um, that that's, that's what happened. Uh, this skull here is believed to be a mace, um, particularly more of a, a smooth type mace injury. You can actually see the indentation around where this was. And again, none of this is, is perfect or ideal, but um, going through the literature, uh, particularly there's quite good literature on, um, on medieval injuries in medicine. And this is, um, these are just some of the, the included things that were, that were thought to be from uh, medieval weaponry. Henry V, I mentioned earlier, took an arrow to the face. Most likely he had his visor up because at this point in history in 1403, most people are wearing enclosed helmets, particularly knights. Um, are wearing enclosed helmets. So he probably had his visor up um, and this arrow most likely ricocheted off somebody else and caught him in the face and it buried itself in the skull back just underneath his left eye. And his surgeon was able to save him. Um, he pulled the, they pulled, they tried to pull the arrow out, um, but the shaft came loose from the head. So the arrowhead was still lodged in the bone um, and his surgeon devised the method where he said every day he ordered the monks where Henry was staying. Um, of course, the first thing was to keep him full of alcohol to try to keep him from feeling such intense pain. But every day they would take a stick and they, and they whittled down sticks to, to uh, very, you know, very small diameters and then increasing in diameter uh, because the wound collapsed once the, uh, once the arrow shaft was out. And so over the series of about four or five days, they enlarged the cavity with the use of sticks that were wrapped with fresh linen and honey. And I don't know how much you guys know about beehives, but beehives, the inside of a beehive is the cleanest, most hypoallergenic thing in nature. It's like 99.9% .9 free of bacteria. Um, in the Middle Ages, we knew this, and it was used oftentimes as, uh, as a cleaning agent or as an antibiotic. Uh, I say that. It was very expensive. So the monks were using it, but many other folks might not be able to. Um, but Henry being the king or future king was in good care. And you can see here um, to the left, this tool. So the, the surgeon that he had ordered this tool, which had never existed before, to be made for, by the local blacksmith. And he drew it out for him and uh, explained it to him. The blacksmith made this and it was a screw. And so he would, he, when the time came and the wound was large enough uh, from the, the sticks with linen and honey, he inserted this into the wound until he realized that he had gotten inside the socket of the arrow that was still, the arrowhead that was still inside. And then when you turn the crank on this device, these arms open up and they are barbed on the outside so that they grip the inside of the socket. And he was able to do that and very slowly pull the arrowhead out and Henry survived. Um, so that's a great example of medical care. It's one of the reasons uh, armor is supposed to help keep you from having to go through something like this. In this case, um, you know, the visor was most likely up, and so he didn't, he didn't have that protection. Um, so that was an example of a survivable wound. This is an example of a primitive cast that was put on a bone. Um, the literature on this is a little bit at odds. Some people say that it was a bone infection that made the bone weak, and so a cast was put on for that. Other people would say it was because it was an, an intense fracture, but new bone growth can be observed underneath that cast. And this was done surgically, um, where, uh, where in literally going into the arm, the cast was put around the bone and then the flesh of the arm was closed back around. And the person did live uh, and lived for uh, at least a few years uh, after this surgery had been done. This is, uh, you're seeing the green here on the bone because that's copper. Um, and presumably uh, at that time, they understood that copper had medical, um, you know, had medical properties. And so 100% pure copper is 
um, is something that, that could be used without causing terrible infection or irritation to, uh, to the body. Uh, this is called the wound man. There are several different iterations of this in medieval art, and you'll see different weapons. You see a dagger here, a sword here, a spear point or lance here, an arrow, a crushing blow from a hammer or club. So you get to see different things. Um, and part of this was just a tradition in art. Part of, uh, part of this you might find in medical manuals or in, um, in treatises about medicine, where students were learning how to treat different types of wounds uh, from different weapons. So with that general info kind of underway, let's talk about um, our combat roles and, and how we're using weapons and armor on the field. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty you know, well known. You have different levels of equipment uh, and pay based on the role that you pay or that you're playing on the field. So somebody that's a knight, for example, has a lot of money, has the best in technology and is playing a role on the field that's different from, uh, you know, from your levied footman who, um, who is on foot, probably with a spear, doesn't have great armor compared to what the knight has. There's different roles uh, and different goals. So infantry um, are around for a tactical goal that is to stand the ground and break the enemy's resolve. The battle is never over until the infantry is routed. So as long as your enemy infantry stands, the battle has to go on. And we've seen this time and time again across the age. And again, that's kind of generally speaking, but it, it's pretty true. Um, you, uh, you might have heavy infantry, you might have light infantry. And again, different purposes uh, at different points in the line. Um, you had cavalry and their tactical goal was to incite fear and to break enemy formations. The, the cavalry was designed to break the infantry line. Infantry warfare was around, uh, has been around for you know, thousands of years, a long time, and was very, um, very important. Um, part, of the, part of the reason for cavalry in the first place was to break enemy lines and cause the, the troops to flee. Uh, they want to run you down. It's what, what they're designed to do. Missile, missile troops um, are disrupting formations and establishing field advantage. When we get into later Middle Ages, they are used with devastating effect um, on armies in the earlier Middle Ages, in the High Middle Ages, and in the Viking Age. Uh, much more of um, battle commencement, harassing um, enemy forces to put them at a disadvantage on the field. Ooh, excuse me. What have I done? Sorry, guys. Let me, what's happened to my Zoom, to my. John, Jonathan, why are you getting this up? Can I just put one poll up? Can yes, please. Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. No, go for it. Do you guys, uh, I'm going to launch it right now. So um, this is the poll that we're, we, we would probably would like to go to different um, dinners or lunches and discuss history, ethnic food like Georgian food, Uzbekistan food, Persian, Greek. So I just wanted to kind of post it out there and just take a vote. Um, so I've seen people on, including including me, but I'm always <sighs> yes. So, <laughs> and then I'm gonna end the poll in, uh, about. Oh, okay. So you know we're getting good results. Couple. Here's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I can uh, I can definitely provide a person uh, uh, that vaccinates people in New York. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, let's make let's get it to a minute and then yeah, I guess. We're not ready yet after everybody gets vaccinated. That's why I put it for a poll. So I just wanted to make sure. And then I'm gonna end this right now. Five more seconds, ending it now. We have three more polls throughout the day to just to make it interesting. Perfect, just jump in whenever you need to post them up. I'm gonna share the results. Uh, there's only you know five people, I guess, participated or whatever. I was uh, one of them. I'm also not in New York, so. Uh, so you can, you know, you can still order wine or whatever, and, you know, order some food and we can do you on Zoom, you know, we can share you with you on Zoom. So thank you. Wonderful. All right. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, moving ahead, infantry formations. We're going to kind of just look at these briefly. <clears throat> so when you see in just a minute, when we see some, some pictures of a lot of this stuff, you'll kind of have an idea of what we're looking at. So typical infantry formations that we know from this time, you might have a static line. Um, where it's just a line of infantry versus another line of infantry. It's often infantry versus infantry engagements. 
where uh, there's fighting up and down along the line. Um, in these engagements, it's you might not even have folks fighting all of the time. You might have some sections of the line that rest while others fight. Um, there's even evidence to show that you might have had like a tag team partner for your partner's fighting and then he gets exhausted or tired and you come in and take his place and then he stays back in the ranks a little bit to rest and then he comes back up front um, <clears throat> to take your place when you need a rest. So um, it's very, it's wild and hairy and we don't understand it perfectly, but there's a lot going on um, within those within those lines. Um, you, you also have a crown formation, which is a little bit uh, more of a defensive um, defensive formation where you might encircle uh, high value targets or just create um, create a circle of some kind for defense. Um, we saw this with the, the Brabanson Infantry at Bouvine in 1214. Uh, William LeBreton tells us about that. Um, the cavalry formations, you uh, most common was a flying wedge where you have a charging cavalry line and you try to just punch through your infantry lines. Um, you have a, a technique called the hammer and anvil, which we'll talk more about in just a second. Uh, missile formations varied, uh, but often missile troops were used on the wings as a way to kind of shoot across the field. Uh, something that we learned, I say we learned, uh, something that was learned widely in World War I, seems to have been known by our medieval forebears also, um, is that uh, your machine guns, at least in World War I, were much more effective when placed on the outside of your lines and they fired toward the middle. They fired across rather than placed in the center and firing out the, the type of, you know, uh, random range that you get with bullets at high, at high speed. Um, it was much more devastating to take your, your missile gun nests and put them on the edge of your, of your trench and kind of cross um, into, the, into the center of, uh, of the enemy as they, as they cross no man's land. Um, but we've seen missile troops who have been placed often on the edge. Sometimes they're in lines in the front. Uh, like at Agincourt, for example, they were on the wings and they were firing in and it was just devastating. So um, they had a lot of those same, those same kind of understandings. Uh, the tournament was something that was a practice for war and it often featured melees, jousts, other spectacles or events um, for, for training, for fun, for learning, all that kind of stuff. So kind of a, kind of a close up look here. Um, this was what a static line formation would look like, infantry versus infantry. Should I, should I minimize this here? Does that help? We see, see a little bit better. Um, we, can, we can make make out. This is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, this is what a circle formation or a crown formation would look like with infantry lines that we just talked about. This is the hammer and anvil. This is where you have mixed forces um, or mixed formations and you have two infantry lines that are engaging one another and the cavalry force um, you know, from one of these one of these forces. In this case, it's the blue line. Um, circumvents the the orange infantry line and attacks them from the back. Um, so you have the hammer that hits the uh, the orange forces onto the anvil of the blue infantry line. Here, uh, oftentimes that was that was a devastating. This is a flying wedge um, against a mixed infantry line. This could be uh, cavalry. It could be infantry. Um, you didn't necessarily have both at the same time that were charging for, for obvious reasons, but um, you might, be, depending on when in the age we're talking about, this might be infantry or it might be uh, cavalry. One of the things that's interesting to notice is that um, a well-disciplined and well-equipped infantry line can repel cavalry charge after cavalry charge. Horses just will not run onto spears. They won't do it uh, or onto pikes. So um, where your infantry line gets in trouble is when they break or when they're, they are not disciplined enough or that fear just overtakes them and they, you know, and the, the line falters. Um, then you end up with gaps in the line that the cavalry can really um, kind of smash through or can take advantage of um, and route your, route your infantry. Um, this, is, uh, this is a mixed formation where, um, where you have mixed forces that are going to be engaging in the battle. And here you can kind of see infantry lines up front um, and around the sides um, that create this kind of box formation that protects your cavalry uh, and your baggage train. So on extended campaign, um, for example, in the Hundred Years' War, when the English are in France for, for you know, months at a time or a month at a time, you might see a formation like this be more common uh, where your cavalry might sally out from the protection of the infantry lines 
um, to do their rating or their work and then come back. Um, something else, and here you can kind of see an example. This is, this is an example of a shield wall of, of some kind or, an, or a well formatted infantry uh, line. This would have been from the early Middle Ages, the Viking Age, of course. Um, but that's just kind of an example. Uh, you know, they, would, they would be tightly packed together um, and, um, you know, and, and close and tight. And this photo comes from uh, my friend Joe Metz. Um, one thing question, that I Jonathan, do, yes. Question, Jonathan. Uh, yes. Pursuing that, um, do we understand what sort of, of, of coordination, be, you know, that was involved in, let's say, an infantry line? I mean, I'm thinking of phalanx tactics in the ancient world where yes. one, you know, one phalangist on his own was useless. It was yeah. only through the coordination of one man protecting another that the, that the, uh, the uh, formation be, became very dangerous. Yes. In, in that same type of shield wall formation, that is, that is what you have. Um, your shield overlaps and protects, uh, protects the man next to you as well as you. Um, and, and it's, it's a little, obviously it's a little bit different than what you would get in the Greek world. Um, but you get a very coordinated effort. Um, you'd something... have to have, you'd have, you'd have to have people equipped with basically identical weapons. Correct. Right? Correct. And that's, and that's where this gets a little bit interesting is in the medieval period, something that I think, um, this is the perfect time to hit this. Um, we did have pitched battles, some of which were very large, but on the whole, the scale of battle is not what you saw in the ancient world where you could expect thousands at a time right. regularly fighting like amongst the Greek city states, that sort of thing. Um, you know, skirmishes and raids were very common. You did have pitched battles and we know about those. Um, but it might be that you have a couple hundred guys against one another or, um, you know, or a few dozen guys against one another. Um, as opposed to always, you know, 5,000 here and 7,000 there, that sort of thing. That stuff did happen. I don't think it was as common as what you saw in the ancient world. I could be wrong about that, but um, from my understanding, it's just not from, from the literature that we can get. Also, one, from, one last part to that question is, yes. how would you evaluate movies, which oh, basically show, you know, these things as being like just a collection of individual duels of of you know people just doing their own thing and you get turned around it's hard even to see who's on which side to some degree that might be true in some cases um there's a reason that heraldry becomes more important as we get into the high middle ages because you need to identify yourself on the field um at this point in history though most here, here's what's interesting um there's not a lot of research on this, so some of this is speculation, but especially in, in the early and high Middle Ages, you're fighting with people that you know. Um, a knight who is bringing people to, to bear arms or to battle um, is coming with his own retinue, folks that he knows, um, and they know him, and they're probably working together, and he probably has a spot along the infantry line where he retreats back to. So once he, let's say, for example, when you have knights that go out for their initial charge, when his lance is broken, he's got two options. He can return back to the infantry line to get another lance or rest a minute, or he can pull out his sword or his axe or whatever his secondary sidearm is there and um, continue to kind of rain down blows on his enemy. And after all of his lances are expended, he's doing that anyway. But if he's returning to the infantry line, he's probably returning to a spot where his people are or to a spot where his equipment is. And he might have levied troops from his own lands that are there, that he knows who they are or they know him. Um, he kind of has this spot. And so you have these kind of smaller groups that kind of coordinate themselves or each other. Um, again, some of that is speculation, but it seems reasonable based on the accounts that we have. Um, one kind of particular that I'm thinking of is the Count of, uh, of St. Paul um, at the Battle of Bouvine in 1214, it said that he's standing next to the infantry line with his helmet removed. So he's having trouble breathing and he's taking a breather, he's resting. Um, and he's standing at, at the point of his infantry line where he's safe. And then he sees one of his retainers, one of his knights that's come with him. Um, it's kind of, you know, like is a little bit lower than him in status. He sees him in trouble out on the field. It says before he could catch his breath, he threw his helmet back on and rode out. So at some point he had returned back to a point of safety to breathe for a second. Then he, he was able to identify somebody that he was working with. 
um, and had to go out and help him. And so there's this back and forth, back and forth. Um, and along the infantry line, you have to have somebody that's in charge um, or somebody that's at least in charge of sections. So it's probably going to be somewhat, I'm sorry, Paul, that's a really roundabout way to answer your question. But there has to have been some sort of command authority in that structure. We don't know exactly what it looks like. Uh, the best that we can do is kind of speculate, especially for the for the Viking Age and the um, and the uh, High Middle Ages. Does that answer your question at all? Can I say something? Um, yes, I, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, uh, uh, but I think compared to the ancients, I don't think it was as disciplined or organized. And the reason I say that is because of the type of weapons they're using. They're using maces. They're using uh, these pole axes. They're using these halberds, which don't really. Uh, they're not as streamlined as the phalanx, I'm sorry, the, the hoplite shield and, and, and the long spear. So I think it was a combination of both. I think uh, initially they, they kind of want to go that direction. Uh, but, you know, once they start having charges or, or crossbows into the mix, then it becomes pretty hard to get a grasp of, you know, sure. but we're, yeah, who knows for sure. And discipline, discipline was achievable. And um, reading in the literature, some guys in particular, um, a historian by the name of J.F. Verbruggen, um, and uh, Bernard and David Backrack um, are their two leading scholars in kind of infantry warfare uh, in the Middle Ages. And they would say that you have different ranks for different weapons. So you have a front rank of spearmen and they are kind of that, you know, that prickly line to keep the horses at bay. Um, and if they can wound the horses or wound the knight on the horse, then at that point when there's confusion, the guys in the second rank who have your axes and your maces and your swords step up and finish off the enemy or finish off the horse, um, that sort of thing. So there has to be, if it's going to work, and sometimes it, it surely didn't work and there was chaos, but if it was going to work, there had to have been reasonable discipline to be able to pull something like that off. So we have examples where that happened. We have also examples where it didn't happen. Um, one of the things I'm thinking of now is, is the Battle of Hastings. The Normans charged the Anglo-Saxon line um, I mean, time after time after time, several times, and the line never broke. So to some degree, there, at least in that instance, there was discipline. But I do think that Sergio is right. I think on the whole, um, you didn't have as many professional combatants or professional soldiers. You didn't have as many uh, people who were trained together and disciplined all the time. Or at least for those that you did, they, they weren't often in the infantry um, in, the, in the high and late Middle Ages. In the Viking Age, they, they would have been probably, especially in Anglo-Saxon context. John, uh, John yeah. but I have a question. Yes. So, um, invasion of Mongols. Uh, yes. You know, when they, they fought against King Bela and his army. Yes. Uh, back in the east. Leibniz. Much lighter, you know, uh, involving a lot of conning where they would eventually, first of their attack with small force and then they'd retreat. Yeah. Uh, and then you have this tanks, really, like horse tank, really. I mean, you have somebody with, uh, you know, pounds of pounds of armor. Yes sitting on a horse and, you know, and then, you know, and fighting against this Mongol so who's been fighting for a thousand years and absolutely masters, they can shoot out of the, you know, riding the horse, you know, upside down. I mean, um, did any of them ever realize like, we got to get rid of some of this armor. This is crazy. This is out of control. Man, great question. Um, I don't think so. I, I, again, I can't say definitively here, um, but I think it was, I don't think it was the armor that was the problem, particularly against the Mongols. It was, it was the uh, ego and the lack of discipline, um, particularly in the Battle of Leibniz, 1242, when you read about the Mongols um, taking over, you know, the forces of, uh, or, or I mean, like just destroying, massacring the forces in the East there uh, from Hungary, Poland, the Holy Roman Empire, um, maybe even a few from France. Um, what got them was the feigned retreat over and over and over again. They charge, and each time that they charge and they shoot, they're taking some casualties. You know, they're dropping horses or they're dropping a few men. Um, and then when they retreat and finally they sell the enemy on the fact that, okay, you got the best of us, and the formation breaks, that's when the Mongols become so dangerous. Because part of what helps, I mean, you know, this uh, a knight in full armor that's that's help um the, the armor can help him stay alive but without support from other units and troops um he can only last so long so i don't think that there was ever a trend toward less armor 
Um, there may have been maybe in some of those micro states there in the east. I'm not really well read in those areas, so maybe. Um, but as a general trend, I don't think that there was that, that mentality was adopted. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, moving forward, a little more, probably a little more quickly now. General time frame is 800 to 1050 for the Viking Age, and again, that's just generally speaking, Vikings. Most of us would probably know this already, but the Norse Raiders from Scandinavia. Um, when you read um, textual sources from this, uh, from this era, one thing that you get over and over and over again is this uncertainty, this fear of attack, not just from Vikings, could be from your neighbors, um, but everybody knew the Vikings in, in the, each of their little communities. They knew this. The, they were prolific raiders. Their boats were fantastic for sailing up shallow rivers. They could cross the ocean or they could come, you know, up the, the Volga River or come, um, you know, come down the into the Loire Valley and, and attack um, just anywhere. Their reach was so far. Um, and they were successful, really, in penetrating the entirety of Europe. We have major settlements in England and France. In England, you have the Dane Law, where almost the entire eastern half of the country was literally under the rule or under the law of the Danes because they were so effective uh, in their raiding and they began to settle there. The Normans in later years are literally Vikings who settled in, in northern France. It's maybe not quite that simple, um, but in, in northern France, uh, the Vikings were very successful and decided to stay there, hence why they were called the Normans. Um, they were North men um, who had settled in that, in that region. Uh, somebody, maybe somebody who's a Viking expert um, or a, you know, a, a, a opposite expert could give us more, uh, more info here but there's definite evidence for trade as far as Baghdad with the Abbasid Empire from uh, during the Viking Age from, from Norway, uh, Denmark, Sweden, these, these areas. Um, and Norsemen, including some Englishmen who were also called Norsemen or at that time Anglo-Saxons, uh, they, they were the, the sole makeup of the Varangian Guard of the, the Byzantine Emperor um, for, goodness, for hundreds of years. And so uh, they became really, really kind of an important um, symbol for, uh, for warfare and for, for prowess uh, on the battlefield. Uh, in the Viking Age, warfare is, um, well, Byzantine Empire aside, in Western Europe, warfare is mostly infantry-based. Uh, there is some cavalry, but it's, it's mostly infantry, mostly involving skirmishes, um, particularly for the Vikings. Size was limited by their naval capacity. Uh, they were often known for hit-and-run tactics, um, in non-settlement areas of their own. They did have settlement areas, but um, they, would, they would really hit and run just about anywhere. Uh, the round shield, when we're talking about armor of the Viking Age, the round shield is the most common defense uh, of the Viking Age. Kite shields begin to develop at the end of this era, uh, but for the most part, it's that classic kind of round shield. Um, and there may not be much other armor at all. There may be a helmet, there may be not. Uh, helmets are common for all types of soldiers. Um, there's been some finds that have like hard, hardened leather or, or uh, boiled leather um in between steel kind of straps. There's at least one helmet that's been found that way. I don't know that there are many others, but most of the helmet finds from this era are all steel construction. Uh, nasal helmets where you have kind of your domed top and then that, uh, that rectangular piece that comes down and helps protect your nose. Um, is common, simple round helms, sometimes called skull caps. They could be, uh, and, and usually were multi-piece construction also where they would be riveted, you know, smaller pieces would be riveted together with, with steel bands. So um, in the earlier part of the Viking Age, um, you know, you may not have helmets if you're not a professional combatant, but professional combatants are going to have helmets and shields. Um, as you move later into the Viking Age, male armor, male hauberks become more common for wealthy or important individuals. And lower status individuals probably have no torso protection um, at all. They're, they've just got a shield and their spear or maybe an ax uh, and maybe some sort of helmet. Uh, period depictions from the time tend to show varying lengths on this male garment. Uh, some of it may be like a true shirt where it just extends to the top of your hips. It's just like a t-shirt that's made of iron rings uh, and would be short sleeved, uh, stopping at the elbow. Some of these uh, go a little bit longer. Uh, that would be the hauberk, and that goes below the knee there. So just, just below the knee to provide extra protection to your upper thighs. Uh, and that kind of became a big deal because you know that you have, major, um, you have a major artery running through, uh, through those areas. You, have, you can lose a lot of blood from, uh, from wounds to your, 
your thighs. Uh, several surviving examples from this period are known from Burka, um, a Viking settlement, um, and then also the St. Wenceslas male, which is known uh, from, um, from about the 10th century. Here in the middle, you see the St. Wenceslas male, and um, this is the most high-risk picture I could find. I'm sorry, it's in black and white. There have been some work that's been done on it through the years as it has, um, as it's kind of deteriorated a little bit, but the majority of the rings in this shirt are from the 10th century, maybe the 11th century. So they are very, very old. Um, it's a surviving piece that's been in collection and museum for a long time. Uh, here you have the typical kind of nasal helmet. This is from the Viking age uh, where you have that domed helmet, which is designed to glance. So if a sore blow hits you uh, on the head, it's designed to kind of glance off to one side. Um, and then this piece here protects your nose. This was another helmet that would have been earlier in the Viking age and was really more common even, even before that, where you have a little bit of cheek protection and, and nasal protection. Um, here on the left, you might see two wealthy, um, two wealthy Viking warriors. You have clearly your skull cap helm uh, and you have a male hauberk, which goes to just above the knee. He wears uh, leg wraps called meningas to uh, partly because that's the fashion, also because uh, when you're trekking through rough ground, they, they help keep your clothes from being torn to pieces. Uh, and then up here, this would have been uh, toward the very end of the Viking Age. This would have been a, a wealthy, um, could, have, could be an Anglo-Saxon Huskarl, uh, could be a wealthy Viking raider um, or Viking nobleman who has good mail. Uh, he's got a very fine ax there, as you can see, and even a painted helm. His sword is on his hip. It's his sidearm ready for use. Um, and then this round shield here, this would be a, a typical approximation of a reconstruction of what we know of round shields. Uh, commonly had a metal boss in the center, um, a grip in the back to hold. Um, and this shield acts as much of a weapon as your sword or your axe or your spear does along with you. What sort of grip did the shields have? Um, goodness. Um, so, and, 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 you know, and Tell us about that as you go through the time. I'm, I'm interested in that. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Viking shield in particular, if you could kind of imagine, Paul, imagine this turning around backwards um, in the, just kind of picture that in your mind, it flips around backwards and the handle is going to be vertical so that I'm grabbing it like this. Um, it's, but it's a, a single, it's not like a, it's not yeah. like a, a, a two piece shield like the, the ancient hoplite shield. No, this, no. this is, yeah, this is made of several boards. Uh, the boards are glued together and are faced with canvas or linen or rawhide, some sort of fabric um, to kind of increase strength a little bit to hold it together. Here, Basically, if I can say something, sorry, I cut you yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, His fist is literally right behind yes. the, the boss. Yes. Okay, so the, and he can a, extend it at full length from his body if he wants to? He could, yes. Yes. Yeah. So unlike the hoplite shield, which is, you know, got a forearm piece and then a second uh, fist grip. Yes, and as we get into more horse work, um, that kind of attachment to the arm becomes more important because you need a hand, you need both hands to control reins or one hand to control the reins and one a weapon. Right. So that does change as we kind of get through and I'll show you, I've got some pictures that show a little bit of that as well in a second. But uh, thank you, Sergio, for that. Yeah, his hand. Yeah, is no right. problem. And I just want to say one other thing, and, it, and it's an advantage not to have that grip that Paul's talking about, like the hotline yes. ones, because it's in the case you just have to let go easily. You yes. could just do so. Whereas if you have a strap on your forearm and you're holding it by your hand, yes, um, yes. it could be a little bit, you know, hard to get away if someone says to grab a shield from you. You know, Correct. so also, you'd imagine that the ability to protect your body on your sword side is much greater. You know, I mean, if you have it tied on your on your left side, it's very hard to get around to the right side to protect yourself. Correct. Yeah, you could say that, but um, I guess their style of fighting it, it just it, it worked for them. You know, it, it, and again, we're talking about mostly skirmishes in this age, or a lot of skirmishes, uh, where you might be more loosely associated. Um, because shields were very common. Now, this this axe is not in particularly from the Viking era, but this sort of bearded pro projection here, this is called a beard of the axe, this, this little projection that comes down here. Bearded axes were very, very common in the Viking era because I can use this to reach out and hook onto that shield, pull it away, and then thrust to the face or, you know, turn and, and strike. So, um, so very, you know, very common um, kind of ebb and flow in that 
in, in that it's almost dance-like um, in, in a lot of ways, maybe not in every way, but in a lot. Um, so let's see here. Uh, weaponry in the Viking Age. Uh, the spear, of course, is by and large the most common weapon. It is, um, you know, it is, it is very much still the, the, you know, the big deal. You want to keep people at length. Um, and spears are very versatile. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, once the swordsman gets inside the spear, it's not that easy. I can pull the shaft back and still get you. Um, so the spear is by and large the most common weapon. Axes are also very common weapons in the Viking Age. Uh, they, they become, again, very common weapons in the, uh, in the late Middle Ages. And in the high Middle Ages in between, I think they're still fairly common, but are more so, um, more so not illustrated or shown in art as much. So perhaps maybe a little bit of a uh, less of a, a fashionable weapon at that time. Um, but in the Viking Age, single-handed axes are common for many fighters. Variations of two-handed axes are the, your hero type warriors. These are your professional combatants um, who, uh, you know, who are using the bigger weapons of that kind. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting, Anna Comnenus, who wrote uh, the Alexiad or the history of her, um, of her father as the Byzantine uh, emperor, talked about the Varangian guard as being axe-bearing barbarians. And so the axe was so common and so much um, sort of an identity marker for these Varangian guard uh, warriors um, that it was so common for them or so, so you know, central to their identity that Anacomnenus writing about them noted that the axe was inseparable from them, uh, so to speak. So swords become common for wealthier men. Axes in many ways are cheaper to produce than swords. Um, may, in some ways maybe require a little bit less skill. A really good ax can be hard to produce. So I don't want to say that it takes less skill, but um, there's a little bit of give and take there. The sword is almost always considered a sidearm. Um, and then those of you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ewart Oakshot, but he, um, he's done, he kind of did the seminal work on the sword uh, in the Middle Ages. Jan Peterson did some work on the sword in the Viking Age. Um, and he has several different types. He has 26 different types, uh, but, but he tends to type swords by, um, by hilt furniture, whereas Oakshot uh, types swords by blade type and then also he has different letters and things for uh, guards and for pommels and all that all that good stuff but uh, within the viking age the oak shot type 10 blade which is a dedicated cutter um, the, the type 10 blades are, are what are common that we find on swords from that period uh, fighting knives and daggers are also known called the sacks or the long sacks for these longer knives and we will now see uh, some of these extant finds from the Viking Age. So looking here, um, you see a good representation. This is a type of ax that was found uh, in the area of Gotland. Um, this would take a pretty skilled smith. This also meant that it was a very light ax um, when you don't have a lot of material here in the center. Um, this could have been ceremonial. It could have been combat related. We're not sure. Uh, from the cross, we know that this belonged to someone who was no longer pagan, but had at least in name um, converted to Christianity. Here in the center, you can see some examples from the Museum of London, uh, which, show, uh, which show the typical hilts of the Viking Age. Um, very much this kind of obtuse, uh, rounded um, pommel, and then the guard, almost like a flattened out disc shape, which was very common in the back here, and, and maybe to the left, you see a little bit more of a point, and then a little bit harder to see, but further in the back, you can look uh, to the back right here and see what looks almost like knuckles. Um, these, are the, these are the most common hilts that are found. We have more sword finds from the Viking Age and from any other era simply because they're still burying people with weapons at this time period. Grave goods are still a very common, uh, very common thing. Um, uh, Jonathan, question. Um, would you say that these uh, blades were made of iron or steel? Or because um, they look like they're heavy. Yeah, to the, to the, best, of, to the best of our knowledge, both. Um, so it's kind of hard to see in these pictures, but in the center of the blade, you would have an iron core, um, which it's cheaper to produce than steel, and it is more, um, it's more flexible than steel. And then around the edge, your cutting edge is hardened steel. So you have multi-part construction. Um, so you have a softer core, which is cheaper to produce, but also keeps your blade flexible. You have the hardened edge, 
that's wrapped around so that you have a nice, sharp, dedicated cutting blade. These swords are not heavy. Um, in their in in their day, they're estimated the average sword is estimated to weigh between two and a half and three pounds, which is really not that much, especially if you're a professional combatant who spends your your time training to use these things every day. Um, you know, you get it in your memory, you build up the, the grip strength and other things that you need. Um, but if I was to, you know, if I was to hand you a sword at an event um, of proper weight, and I've done this a hundred times, uh, you know, given, given somebody a sword and the first thing they say is, wow, that's lighter than I thought. Uh, in the movies, we always look at people with these big, you know, hewing blows with swords and we think that they look really heavy. Uh, but swords are light and nimble for the most part. Even some of your two-handed ones in a later age are, are still pretty light and flexible. So um, your guard and your pommel are still going to be like mild steel or iron. At this age, iron more than mild steel. Um, but something, too, that I think is important to, to point out is, is the decorative element. Um, particularly combat-purposed weaponry um, is decorative and is beautiful. Um, you know, there's a oh, – I can't remember the guy's name now, but he's the um, – you know, he's the, he was a former curator of the British Museum, and he said that as long as people have been making things, they've been making them beautiful. Even everyday objects that are meant for, um, you know, for just, just multi-purpose use, uh, they, we still wanted them to be beautiful. Uh, we have them in yes. Question in that regard. I remember um, the Medici was involved in uh, particularly, you know, curving or the, the armor so to speak, um, you know, design. And also for Arabic um, weaponry, there used to be engravings and of oh, yes. holy, holy scripture. Yes, Arabic weapons are highly decorated. Um, in Viking weapons, at least in the Viking age at this time, you, it's not uncommon to find, you can see inlay here on this. Uh, can everybody see when I move my mouse? Can you see that fairly well? Um, you can see some, some some inlay here. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this example is Latin, L-A-T-T-E-N, which is a medieval form of brass, or if it was actually uh, gilded, so actually gold. Um, but you can see intricate carving, um, scroll work that's there. In the blades, you can even see it on this blade. Uh, it's very faint, but you can see, um, you can see inlay decoration. Ulfbert blades, um, were common where you might have a very high quality weapon with the word Ulfbert in it. Um, so you have, um, you know, you have, you might have in the later ages, you'll have design scriptures, same kind of thing. Uh, but some of the Arabic weapons of this period are, are, and they deserve their own presentation, but they are very highly decorated and richly decorated. Um, here to the bottom, you can see some more examples of surviving swords. Um, again, oak shot type 10 blades, which have a, a very wide or a wider fuller, which is the middle section of the blade that's kind of cut out. Um, sometimes people call that a blood groove. That's completely wrong. It's a fuller. Um, it has two purposes. It's meant to lighten the weight of the blade. Uh, and also it actually structurally reinforces the blade a little bit more. Um, in, common, um, in common construction, we use steel I-beams um, for heavy load-bearing uh, weight. Uh, because I-beams are very stable. And even though it's not the exact same application, you get a very similar effect uh, by grinding out the, the center of that blade. So you lose weight and you, you add some structural capacity as well. So swords, you know, again, uh, were common for your upper class warriors. Uh, here in the middle, we have some more common axes. Um, these could have been tools. They could have been weapons. They could have been both. It's hard to, to tell. Uh, the axe up here on the right, this is the, the long guide axe, um, definitely a combat axe. And one of my favorite things about this, this blade is huge, but it is so light. Look at the cross section right here. That is, that is remarkably thin. Um, and this is a blade that is designed to cut soft targets. You know, it's designed for, uh, for, for use against people rather than, you know, cutting trees or things like that. Um, again, probably a mild steel body on this axe. Um, and then you can see uh, right along this edge here, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see it better up here. Um, a thick, a thickened edge a little bit right here, or the edge itself is very thin, but um, the edge piece is thicker. And that's because that is where your, um, that's where your hardenable steel is, is uh, forge welded onto the mild steel or iron body of the ax. So you have a reinforced cutting edge, which is very sharp and very hard. Um, and then your nice flexible, it's not necessarily flexible, but more um, it has more absorption for impact. 
Um, this is, and this is very helpful with an impact weapon like an ax. Uh, these examples here from the, uh, this is again from the, the London Museum or the, um, this one, I, I think the Long Island Axe is British Museum, but it might be the Museum of London. Um, these are definitely Museum of London. These heavy kind of, uh, they're not heavy, but they're heavy combat weapons. They're very light, uh, but, but two-handed combat axes. Uh, Viking spears. Uh, down here on the left, you can kind of see um, from the sagas, when we read Viking sagas, the spear is a, is a high, um, highly written about weapon. It's very common. Um, there's even some, uh, some weapons that, that are translated as hewing spears. So some might have been used for cutting, but we don't know if that's like an early halberd. We don't know if it's a spear that's meant for cutting. Uh, most spears are just meant for thrusting and are very effective at that. And then here on the right, we have a sax. Um, this is that kind of combat knife that we talked about. And again, you can see that it's a decorated example. So it was, it probably belonged to someone, uh, someone fairly wealthy. So moving in, goodness. Moving into the high middle ages, our general time frame here again is around 1050 to 1300. And it's characterized by increasing technology and population um, is booming at this time. We have something called the 12th century Renaissance. Where, uh, where there's just a great advance in technology and in, um, and in written record and surviving written records. Um, people seem to be flourishing at this point in time. And also this is not for everyone, but this is the, the this kind of um, high middle ages era is the foundation for, um, for a lot of the universities that we see in Europe that are still around, like, you know, Oxford, um, uh, was founded in the 13th century in like the 1220s, maybe around 1225 or so. It's kind of a, a universally accepted date um, or central date. Um, you have some universities, particularly in Italy, like the University of Bologna that's been around since like the 11th century. So they've been around a long time. But a lot of universities were founded. Uh, those that were founded in this age, um, you know, were, were flourishing and growing at this time. Um, a rise in urbanization leads to the foundation of city militias. So you have, um, you have some cities and particularly in, in Italy and some in Germany, excuse me, um, you get this as well, but you get people who live within the urban sphere who do their time as, as um, you know, on guard duty or protecting the city. If the city was under attack, they would, um, you know, they would serve as the military men, but they're not professional combatants. They do receive some training, they receive some, uh, some equipment. Um, and as we get into the later Middle Ages, of course that grows. Um, almost exponentially. Uh, that becomes a very common method. Um, this period features major international conflicts. We have crusades that are going on both in the Middle East and over also in uh, the Baltic region in particular, some also in Spain as well. Um, so international, the meeting of international entities is happening uh, for the first time in a long time in major ways in this area since probably the first time really since Rome in many ways. Um, which is very interesting. So it, it impacts uh, culture, um, you know, trade in, in, in knowledge, uh, particularly medical knowledge, but also in the development of arms and armor. We also get the rise of the monastic military orders in this era, the, the Templars, the Hospitallers, the Teutonic Knights, um, you know, some of, the, some of the other lesser known orders as well. And warfare begins to move from an infantry dominated sphere to a cavalry dominated sphere. Uh, particularly once we get into the 12th century. So when we're talking about armor of the High Middle Ages, shields are still very common for knights, um, but they may or may not be common for infantry, uh, which is kind of a shift away from that, that Viking mentality. Kite shields are, again, the norm early on, and I'll show you what a kite shield looks like in a minute. It's the classic kind of teardrop shape. Um, we'll show it to you in just a minute. But various types of what are called heater shields, which are kind of our triangular shaped shields, but are smaller than a kite shield. Uh, various types of those become more common, particularly as time advances. And you can kind of see, uh, I'll show you here in a minute, I've got a picture where you kind of see this timeline of stuff as it moves through. Um, helmets are still common for all types or class of soldiers. And we move into all steel construction uh, for sure. Nasal helmets are common from around the 1050s into the, into the beginning of the 13th century, skull caps, uh, and what are later called cervelliers, which are sometimes called secret helms, or very small single piece skull caps, uh, begin to, to appear and particularly become more common around the middle of the 13th century, so around 1240s, 1250s and beyond. 
uh, faceplate helms of various styles. So now we're not just protecting the, the head, but we begin to protect the face um, and parts of the neck as well. That begins to develop around the 1180s through the 1240s before we move into the full-blown great helms um, around 1250 or in the 1250s. And those continue to be popular in, in certain forms and fashions all the way into the 14th century. And then the classic kettle helm, which is uh, which is, um, you know, kind of, it's, it's almost like, um, like a boonie hat. Like I've got, let me show you this example here. This is the, let me turn my camera back on so I can see. This is the classic kind of kettle helm. It's protection for your, your head and then a brim around the top. Um, we'll see some pictures of this again in a second, uh, but this is common and this becomes common for soldiers all the way up into World War I. Uh, when you look at World War I photos of, uh, American troops and British troops and in, in some ways even the German troops like they're wearing helmets they're single piece construction rather than multi-part construction but they're that that style does not go out of favor um, it's easier to make it doesn't restrict your breathing or your vision so depending on what type of, of role you're playing on the battlefield that becomes a very attractive option for folks uh, male hauberks are still the ubiquitous uh, protection for professional soldiers. In fact, the high middle ages is often referred to as the age of male, uh, where male armor just proliferates. Um, early depictions show well-fitted male for the upper body, including a coif, which is kind of like a hood um, of male that protects your neck and your head. Uh, sometimes that would be integral, meaning it's part of your actual, the, the hauberk or the piece you're wearing over your torso, over your chest. It's just a hood that you pull up, almost like a hoodie. Um, and in other ways, uh, especially as we move through, through toward the end of the High Middle Ages, it becomes a separate piece um, and it fits very tightly. Male chausses, which are, are leggings that cover, uh, cover your legs, they begin to appear around the late 12th century. And in the High Middle Ages, in the 13th century, we begin to get plate armor for the first time other than, for, than in helmets. Um, and it's interesting that the first, um, most of the first developments are around um, are around uh, joints and around legs. You get pull-ins, uh, which are knee, knee protection um, in the 1220s is the earliest kind of known um, example of those. Um, we get something called the coat of plates, which is smaller plates that go over your male hauberk. It was worn on your torso. That happens around the 1240s to the 1250s. Armor for your shins called shin balds first appear in the 1250s. A uh, plate for your elbows called couteurs begin in the 1260s, and then spalders for your shoulders first show up around the 1290s. Um, and, and interestingly, um, you know, a lot of this, is, these are the, even if you're on horseback, these are the vulnerable areas um, to attack. That also can, can very much limit your ability to be an effective combatant on the field. Padded armor is still a thing. Uh, gambesons are quilted garments that are worn by lower status fighting men, and these are designed to be like standalone body armor. Um, sometimes they might be stuffed with like raw cotton or horse hair or rags. Um, sometimes there are multiple layers that are sewn together. Um, these definitely appear by the 12, uh, by the 1210s. We start to see them in art. Uh, we have record of some of them, maybe even as far back as 1181 in the, the English Assize of Arms. Um, and then you have a very similar garment called the Akaton uh, that is worn under mail, but it is a much thinner garment um, where the, the gambeson is thick and it's designed to be your sole protection. The Akaton, um, and some, there's, there's a lot of debate about this. Some people, um, you know, think that, that they didn't exist. Other people do. I tend to be in the camp to say that they did exist. I think there's decent evidence to show it, um, but definitely that they would have been much thinner. Um, you can't compromise your mobility but they absorb some of the shock that comes from being hit because, you know, even if I'm, even if I'm wearing mail, I'm just wearing bare mail um, without any kind of padded, even if it's like a thick wool tunic, like blanket thickness kind of tunic um, underneath, uh, I, you know, I'm still very susceptible to, to that kind of shock uh, of a crushing blow. Uh, Queases are padded protection for the thighs that begin to appear. They begin to appear at 12 tens in written records. King John ordered some from his personal tailor known as William the Tailor um, in the 12 tens in the Latin that they're known as quiseras, um, meant for the thighs. And then curbuli, which is hardened leather, 
uh, is around. And there's a type of garment that's referred to mostly in text. It's very hard to find it illustrated. So I'm going to show you some examples that I think could be um, Curie, but it's really hard to say definitively. But we know, for example, um, from, uh, from about four or five different written sources as early as the late 1170s and 11, or early 1180s, um, that this might be worn. And in a lot of cases, it might have even been worn over male. Uh, it might have been worn as an extra level of protection as we kind of move through. So looking here, you will see some examples. And I'm gonna kind of pull up our faces here a little bit so I can see if people have questions. Here at the top left, this is from the Messiaski Bible, uh, late 1240s, early 1250s. And this is a decent example of a gambeson. This is what standalone quilted armor would look like. You can see the nice quilting lines that move along this garment. Um, whoever the illustrator was for this, for this work um, went to great detail um, to show what was, what was common. He's wearing a regular tunic underneath it, but you can see it looks to be thick, a thickly padded garment. He has protection for his neck as well on this, on this garment. Um, so he's not the best armored, but he has good armor. This is designed to protect him. Here in uh, the middle of the top picture, you can see tailored mail. Do you see how tightly that fits along his arms? Um, it's hard to see at this level, but you see a different weave or change in the way that this mail is constructed here to expand for his chest and to fit very tightly um, so it, that it moves with him as he uh, is on horseback or as he's uh, wielding his weapons, you see this very finely tailored male. This is, of course, a, a modern reproduction, um, but based on what we see in effigies and in many manuscripts, you see, um, you know, you see this nice tightly fitting male. Here to the right is an example of the earliest known coat of plates. This is on the statue of St. Maurice in uh, Magdeburg Cathedral in Germany, and you see rivets that come across the bottom here of this, of this garment and then another row of rivets up here along the chest. And these are the plates uh, that are lined up vertically inside that provide extra protection to his chest. Did someone have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, this is just always I thought that that male um, yes. suit that the knights wear in the reconstruction, it is perfectly tailored. And, and my, my this, again, this is just my thoughts that we know that metal doesn't stretch so what do you think his, his comfort level as far as mobility was versus something that was maybe one slight size um, larger so that he could, I don't know, stretch a little, you, you don't, you, you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Like I would, say, constricted. I would say it's very comfortable and it doesn't constrict him as much as it looks like it's well fitted. But right now you can see this little bunch right here around the belt. It's hanging. And what that means is that it's very well fitted to him but something that's very hard to see without getting close up picture of the rings is the rings can slide across each other. So there is a certain amount of expansion and contraction that happens as you move. Now, you can't see it here by the way that he's standing, but in the armpits, he has a gusset. This is actually tailored like a, like a cloth garment. So you have a, dime, a, piece of, a diamond shaped piece of fabric that goes uh, long ways here in the armpit which allows full movement of his shoulders. And here in the front, you can see this bunching right here um, on the front, which allows for him to spread his legs wider were he to mount a horse uh, or were he to take a wider stance on, on the ground. Um, some, some illustrations in this period will also show a slit in the mail that uh, you can actually see this down here on this figure, a slit in the mail, which allows for wider movement of the hips, particularly to be on a horse. Um, so we get both. We get slits and then we get skirting of the male. You have gores that go into the male just like you would in a regular tunic. Uh, so these long triangular pieces that are small at the top and then they flare toward the bottom, which allow for expanding and contraction in that garment. Um, does that answer your, your question all, Sergio? Sure, sure. Thank you. Yes. Oops. So here we begin to see, uh, we see some examples of plate armor coming in for the first time. This is an illustration of an early Polen. You see it poking out from underneath his surcoat here. Uh, this is knee protection. 
And if you are a knight on horseback, um, one of the parts of your body that is particularly vulnerable to infantry troops are your legs and your knees are a soft target. Meaning that even if I'm not able to cut through that mail, if I can hit your knee with a good shot, you're, you're, probably, um, you're probably not going to be nearly as effective. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience on horse, um, but a lot of my, my contacts and folks who do will tell you that you use your knees when you're on a horse. Um, so this, this would explain why this might be one of the first uh, areas to get plate protection. Over here to the right, we have an example of a surveillier. Um, this is that, that small uh, helm like a skull cap, which goes, um, which goes on the head and actually goes underneath this great helmet um, or a type of helmet like this. The, the, it's theorized that the great helmet was used or the great helm was used in the charge, in the nightly charge where they ride knee to knee with other horses straight down the battlefield to try to break the infantry lines. Um, you want this full protection from spears and arrows and things that are coming your way. But once that line is broken and you need to have a little bit more uh, awareness about what's happening around you in the battlefield, um, kind of in the cleanup phase of what's going on, you might ride back to your infantry line and ditch this helmet. Um, and then you have this one on underneath it, which provides not only extra protection for you, but allows you to sally out without the restrictions uh, in vision and breathing that you get from, from something like this. Um, this surveillier in particular has received a blow, and this is believed to be from an ax um, in what I read from this museum's collection. And uh, it, you can see it did some decent damage. Uh, perhaps the wearer survived, perhaps they didn't. You can see holes here along the edge where a padded cap would have been riveted inside. So you have padding underneath this to absorb the shock of some of those blows. If this person survived, um, I'm, they undoubtedly had a concussion or some other, some other terrible form of, um, you know, of lasting impact um, because that's a pretty serious blow. Um, here down to the left is an example of what I think could be a curie, the leather, the leather garment that we talked about, that kind of very stiff and, and um, it's called curbouli boiled leather. We don't know exactly how, the, how it was it was made. Um, it's probably not just simply boiled because leather that's boiled is very hard, but also super brittle. So um, it, it was first given to us um, by someone who it looked like to the best of their understanding, whoever was making this stuff, it looked like they were boiling it or they were doing something to it. So it became called boiled leather or, or curbouli. But you can see how stiff the garment looks. Uh, the shoulders flare up. Um, the sides are very stiff. It could be that this is a padded um, garment on the outside and it's just very thickly padded. And so you have, you know, this um, extra protection from the padding, but you have uh, you have these flared shoulders because it's so thick, it's a structured garment. Um, but it could also be a curie. And one of the other things that tells us this is these ties right here along underneath the armpit and at the bottom. And then also you can kind of see a, a glimpse of one in the back as well. Um, so a very tough type of uh, possibly anyway, leather vest um, that provides great protection for your torso here. Um, and on the right, uh, this, is, this uh, example is included because this is an example of a kite shield. The boss is retained from the Viking shield in that Viking era, but we now have a, a much more elongated design. Um, you still have this roundish element at the top to protect your body, but this is a shield that's designed for use on horseback. And so when you're on horseback, say like in this example, this long extension comes down and covers uh, your exposed leg there on the, on the side of your horse. So the kite shield is, is a cavalryman shield, much more so than an infantry shield. Uh, over here to the right, this is, um, this is just a picture of a reenactment group that I'm a part of. Um, and we reenact the early 13th century. And here in the, this is kind of in the sweet spot of the high middle ages. And you can see a sampling of what might be seen on the battlefield. Over here to the right, you have your fully armored knights. Um, this gentleman here um, is, um, is fully armored. You see all the way down to his hands, he has male chosses on his legs and he has an early example of a faceplate helmet. So not only is his head protected, um, but his face is protected. Uh, here to the right is another knight. He has 
long sleeves. He doesn't necessarily have the mittens, but he's got a heater type of shield. You can also see this on his back a little bit. And Paul, I'm not sure if you're still with us. You can see a little bit of the strapping uh, that comes in on this. Um, now we have something called a gauge, which is a long strap on the shield, which hangs over your shoulder and allows that to still cover the side of your body while you hold the reins with your left hand um, or your right hand, if you are right-handed. Uh, this same shield is seen here, uh, strapped to the forearm. Uh, on this other gentleman, uh, he has a skull cap or a type of surveillier. Uh, still probably a little bit early for this design, um, but, but pretty close. He doesn't have any male leggings on. So he's, uh, at least in the, in the way that we portray it, he's a young knight um, of noble birth, but, and he's in service to our uh, landed night here. So he has good equipment, but not quite as good as this gentleman has. Here on the far left. The previous uh, picture you had of the skull cap helmet, there yes. were little holes in it. Yes. Was that used to suspend uh, chain mail to protect um, the neck? Um, maybe, maybe in the early Viking period, yes. In that particular museum example, it's believed to be for a padded insert uh -huh. um, to go underneath to, to kind of help with some of the, uh, absorbing some of those cushioning. Or <laughs> The liner. Yes, exactly, a helmet liner. Um, over here, you, we have, uh, I portray a professional combatant who's, a not, who's not of noble birth. This would have been someone who we would call as a, a sergeant status. Um, I have a male hauberk, um, and I have a thin padded garment underneath. I don't have any leggings. I have an open-faced helmet, um, and I have an axe. So I'm supposed to be an infantryman here. Um, an axe of this size is not something you use from horseback. Uh, it's meant to be used on the ground. And then here in the middle, we have our levy troops. You can see these two gentlemen in white have thickly padded gambesons. This is their standalone armor. Um, they, are, they are troops that are on the ground. Um, so they have their long spears to keep the enemy at bay. Um, and they have, their, uh, they have their helmets on. And these helmets would have been considered an older style around 1200. Um, so for somebody that has less money, you're still by the size of arms required to show up with a helmet, something you have to have. So you have a helmet, but it's probably an older helmet, um, or it might be uh, an older style that's easier to make. It costs less money. So the shield is still important. Um, and here again, Paul, uh, this is a little bit of speculation, but you can see the gauge strap that goes around the neck here um, and doing some, doing some kind of experimental archaeology, so to say, or some experimental combat. Um, you, with the right strapping, and particularly with the strapping, sometimes called N-arms, uh, the French term, E-N-A-R-M-E-S, uh, that we know from surviving examples of this time, you would be able to get some protection from your shield and still use a weapon two-handed, uh, particularly a spear. Um, so things of that nature. Interestingly, that it's, it's reminiscent of the shield used in the Macedonian phalanx, where they had to operate a two-handed, you know, 18-foot yes, long spear. Lance. Yes. Um, and speaking of long lances, you can kind of see here our knight has uh, what we would call a lance. This is, uh, this is around 10 feet. These, these spears here are um, about seven to eight feet. This is about 10 feet. So from horseback, uh, you want a little bit of a longer reach. Um, and so it, it is um, believed, I say theorized, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty well believed um, that, um, that you're, you're, you're not on horseback has a lance with a longer reach as well, because he can now reach troops on the ground as he thunders across the battlefield. Um, the weaponry of the high middle ages, the lance is your primary weapon. It's a perfect transition because your lance is the primary weapon of the knightly charge. And this is how, um, this is how every, everybody wants to start combat um, in this age is with the knightly charge. Multiple lances are probably being used in a battle. Uh, spears are still common for infantry. Swords are becoming more common and we have different blade types. We have the oak shot type 10 through the oak shot type 14. I'll show you some of those in a little bit. Axes do remain in use, most likely single-handed for cavalry um, and single or two-handed for infantry. Again, they're, they're considered probably a lower class weapon at this point in time, uh, whereas they were high class weapons both before in the Viking age and after in the late middle ages or at least certain types of axes were. Daggers really begin to appear in earnest. You have uh, your basic styles, your Quillen dagger, your Basilar dagger, and your antennae daggers. I'll show you those in a minute. Blunt weapons are around, and because people are becoming more armored, blunt weapons are becoming more popular again. Your mace and club um, are common. And then a flail. This is a very highly disputed weapon, um, but there is evidence to show that it exists and might have been used, and we'll talk about that here in just a second also. 
for your ranged weapons, your bow and crossbow are very common um, for, for ranged weapons, but you also have slingers. Um, for example, um, Henry II ordered slingers uh, to be used in siege warfare. Um, so guys literally showing up with a sling and rocks, and they are devastatingly effective uh, when employed well. And then uh, another type of siege weapon called a staff sling, which you use to lob uh, and throw heavier objects. Um, the staff sling was also common in naval warfare uh, because you could launch uh, grenade-like napalm, like uh, type weapons. So ceramic, uh, ceramic containers with, with uh, Greek fire um, could be used and launched to enemy ships uh, in order to emulate, um, emulate those boats. Um, here in the first picture to the left, we see the three dagger types that were known in this period from, um, from manuscripts and surviving uh, examples here. These are all modern reproductions. Here on the left, you have a quill and dagger, which essentially is, is like a miniature sword. You have a pommel, a grip, you have a guard, and then a blade. Uh, here it looks very much like a sword blade. Uh, the earliest forms of Basilard daggers are known in France and Germany at this time, particularly in Germany. You have a characteristic eye-shaped handle um, no, no guard or pommel to speak of, a cap toward the end and a cap on the front, um, and a very much a triangular blade. This is a stabbing blade. This is meant to burst rings of mail and to get in gaps in the armor uh, to try to deliver some stabbing blows. Um, and then the antennae dagger, which is very similar to a quillen dagger, uh, except you have more base plates um, and guard plates here rather than pommels and, and full-blown guards. Uh, here to the right is a mace that was found in Wales in the 13th century, and this is, this is bronze. Uh, it's cast bronze. Bronze is used a lot still in the medieval period. Um, it's, very, it's very hard. Bronze is harder than a lot of people realize, um, and, and is very effective at delivering the blows. And this was cast, and you can see that it was cast by the, the, the points, um, you know, you can melt bronze and pour it into a mold and receive these, these nice pointy sharp objects. Um, and where this is really helpful with maces is it centers all of the force of the blow on these tiny points. So it's massive concussion, uh, massive concussive power in delivering a blow. And this is designed to break armor, to bust armor, to break bones beneath armor. Um, and these heads are fairly small. Uh, but they, they are devastatingly effective. And here you can also see a little bit of the wooden haft uh, that survived still stuck inside the, the shaft of the mace. Um, questions? Do we have questions? Okay. Um, here on the bottom left, you can see a spear. Uh, again, this is another photo from uh, my friend Joe, uh, who's kindly allowed us to use it. But you can see that, especially once we get into the high middle ages, you begin to see uh, banners on your spear as a way to help uh, define you on the battlefield. Heraldry on your banners for your spears or on your surcoats become more important, especially as your face becomes more obscured by enclosed helmets. It's harder to tell who's who without something to, to let you know who is who on the battlefield. Um, this is a Type 12 sword um, in, let's see, I believe that this is in, um, I believe this is in a museum in Munich. Um, but it has the classic kind of rounded disc pommel um, and straight guard of the high middle ages is very common in weapons of this period. And here in the bottom right, we have uh, a sample of Matthew Paris's Chronica Majora, which shows the staff sling in use. Uh, and this is actually uh, the fifth crusade at Damietta. And there was a siege tower built on top of a boat to give them advantage, uh, height advantage to try to, to take stones or other, other forms of offense and lob them um, over the walls or to, to hit them into the walls to create weak spots uh, in the wall. And we see other weapons also that are appearing in this time. You can see the ax is still around. Um, and then by the, this is around the 1270s right here. And these are men in full mail. So they are probably high status individuals and they are using the ax. And you can see the axe in this, at this time period is beginning to develop a spike on the back. This isn't true of every axe, um, but this is a purposefully made combat axe. And we, we can tell that by who's using it. Number one, fully mailed warriors. And also this spike uh, allows you to try to, again, bust rings of mail and, and to punch through uh, the mail and padding underneath and to, and to, to create, um, to create uh, those kind of stab wounds in the body. 
Uh, here in the top right, we have falchions, which are very, they're shorter blades, but they're very broad. Um, and these are, these seem to be dedicated cutting blades because they're very thin. Um, there's a, there was a, you know, a kind of a movement um, about 10 or 15 years ago where these were thought to be kind of a cross between a sword and an ax. They're supposed to be percussive cutters and they're heavy. Um, there's been a gentleman by the name of James Elmsley who has developed a falchion typology and has also done a lot of work on falchions. He probably knows more about falchions than any other, um, you know, any other uh, smith or, or scholar around at this time. And his belief is that these were dedicated cutting weapons. Um, they've been around, the earliest example that I know of um, and that, that at least I've seen found uh, is this example right here in a stone relief work. This is a mantelpiece that currently is in a museum in Milan um, from 1171. Uh, you can see the single edged blade here and a hooked handle, which was common, particularly for the lower class versions of this weapon. Um, your upper class versions tend to have uh, guards and pommels very similar to what you might see on swords. Um, here on the bottom left, this is from, uh, this is, this was statue work on Lincoln Cathedral before it was destroyed in the bombings of World War II. And you here see a long hafted mace. This is the earliest known example I'm aware of of a, of a flanged type mace. Um, and again, this is designed to create, to create uh, percussive points that will, that will focus the energy of the strike and, and bust or break armor. Uh, here in the middle is a flail. Um, this is from mid 13th century and this is stonework um, on the outside of a cathedral in France. Um, usually just illustrated as a wooden haft, a chain of some type and a steel ball. Sometimes it's shown in the hands of demons. Sometimes it's shown in the hands of soldiers. Um, you get a couple of different elements. So sometimes it's the real baddies that have these weapons and, and it might be actually shown to show that they were evil. Um, or that they were enemies as opposed to a real weapon, but um, the flail was definitely used as a weapon later uh, in the later Middle Ages, particularly in the Hussite rebellions in the 15th century. Um, again, a kind of an, another example of a sword. This is one of the earliest examples of what's believed to be a two-handed blade. Uh, this is an oak shot type 12A, so a, a longer blade, a little bit more slender blade, a two-handed grip. Could be used one-handed because it's light, but uh, could also be used two-handed. This is a sword of Conrad of Thuringia. Uh, around the 1240s when this is this came about it's very richly decorated you can see in the pommel um, it, there's there's carving and inlay and all kinds of nice things and then here on the right it's just a sampling of manuscript from about the 1250s or 1260s that shows all kinds of ranged weapons in use you have a crossbow that's being used from uh, the fortification under siege and then here by the besiegers you have uh, a, a bow being used and a sling being used um, as well. So again, these were, these were weapons that were, that were common in the siege that could have been used on the battlefield as well. Particularly the sling seems to be uh, very, very much a, um, a siege type weapon. Um, more weapons of the high middle ages. You see a crossbow here, an extant crossbow believed to be from the early uh, 14th century, maybe late 13th century. Um, uh, you have a wooden, wooden prod here uh, along with a twisted, uh, I believe that this is hemp rope. I don't think this, uh, this rope is original um, to, this, to this crossbow, but here you have a stirrup because as the crossbow increased in power, uh, you put your foot through the stirrup on the ground and you need that pressure to help pull the, um, to pull the string back and, and knock it in order to, uh, to fire. Uh, the crossbow is a much more common weapon than what the longbow would be, particularly in the later Middle Ages, because it's much easier to learn how to use one of these. Um, Can I add something, Jonathan? And, yes, please. And the white part of that crossbow is yes. made of most likely, if not bone, ivory. And the reason for yeah. that is because Before. it gives it a very slick runway. It actually yeah. helps the arrow go out much faster than if it was just all wood. Now, they had all wood ones as well. Yes. But as, as you know, time after time, when that, when that string hits that bow, it's yeah. going to cause a lot of wear and tear. So that's actually a, a really fancy um, crossbow, German style yeah. crossbow that somebody Especially would the wood, and, and even to hardwood. And so bone or horn, well, less, some horn, less horn, probably more bone, um, or ivory, as you said, would have been more common, uh, because they're very hard and our slit can be polished. Um, here to the right, we have a modern reproduction of an oak shot type 14 sword. You can see that this is a single handed sword and the blade is now much wider. We're getting more of a, a triangular shape. This is a cut and thrust weapon for sure 
um, as we're moving more into an age where thrusting for swords becomes more important or as important as cutting. Um, here on the left, we see an example of a bow. This is actually a hunting scene. And here at the top of this image, you can see the blunt arrow. So he's hunting, he's hunting fowl. Um, and uh, the, the blunt arrow would, uh, you know, be enough to kill the bird, um, but uh, would also mean that this can most likely be reused without too much trouble. But this is a great, um, this is a great shot of a bow in use. I wanted to kind of see that. And you can see he had drawn the bow with two fingers. I thought it was very interesting that the, the manuscript uh, artist chose to, or the illustrator chose to include that detail as well. Uh, may, have, may have been used with three fingers, may have been light enough to where he was able to use two. Um, here in the center, we have an example of a sword from the late 14th, or sorry, late um, 13th century, right around the turn from 1200s into 1300s. You have a spherical pommel as another style that begins to show up about this time, uh, a nice cross guard here. And this blade, um, there's debate about what this blade is. This blade may be an oak shot type 13, which is a wider blade but it doesn't narrow as much uh, down toward the tip, and it is, a, it is a dedicated cutting blade as well. Finally, on the right, we see an example of an axe here and two examples of war clubs. Um, so these are definitely um, weapons that are, that are meant to, um, you know, to, to kind of finish the job. Could have been used by guys on horseback. Most commonly, uh, I mean, almost overwhelmingly shown, um, clubs anyway, shown with infantry personnel. So um, particularly this example down here from the Masiowski Bible, you can see the iron or, or bronze studs that have been hammered into this uh, wooden club to try to focus, again, create a focused point for more of that energy. And a, a good shot from one of these things is, is gonna do you in uh, without, without much trouble. So um, questions on that before we move on to the late Middle Ages. Great, moving on. Um, kind of our general characteristics here, the late Middle Ages, time frame 1300, 1500, we begin to see something that we call the infantry revolution during the first half of the 14th century. And this is where your knights who have trained their entire lives for battle, um, wearing the best equipment uh, are, are getting, uh, in particularly these battles I've listed here, Sterling Bridge, Courtrai, Bannockburn, Morgarten, um, across the continent and even in England, they are getting destroyed by levied infantry. Um, people who are farmers and tailors and uh, plowmen and people who are not professional combatants um, are somehow starting to be able to show up and to take them down. And particularly at Court Ryan 1302, the, the French knights were just obliterated by Flemish noble, uh, by Flemish uh, peasants. Um, and it comes down to the type of weapons that they were using and the type of formations that they're using. There's some debate about this infantry revolution, whether or not it happened as drastically as it appears um, or you know, kind of contributed to this rise or not. Um, but it is a known thing. Um, and it kind of changes the course of weaponry as we move forward to, to being more, um, more focused on uh, weapons that can defeat armor. Ranged weapons begin to be used en masse to create, um, to create a weakness in the enemy and it's used to great effect. Um, particularly the English in the Hundred Years' War are just famous for this because they were absolutely devastating. Uh, Cressy, Poitier, um, Agincourt, um, great, great battles that many of us are probably familiar with. Uh, mercenary units of professional crossbowmen have existed in the high Middle Ages, but they become really common in the, in the later Middle Ages. Um, you have these roving companies of professional combatants who just kind of go from region to region um, and are hired as professional mercenaries. You must spend your whole life uh, fighting, uh, you know, hill town wars in Italy and then over into southern France and then into central Germany and back and forth. And they're literally just companies for hire. Um, some of them carried pretty poor reputations as well um, as being, um, you know, they would, they would come into a region and kind of take what they wanted. Um, if you were a nobleman or a, or a king of some kind, you didn't want to see these guys hanging out in your lands for too often. Um, Gunpowder also becomes a, a thing and becomes a real thing. Cannons for siege, handguns um, as well toward the, toward the end of the age become really important. Um, also, multiple tragic events happen that, that lead to, um, to serious conflict and, and, and conflict on the serious scale, or at least set the stage for that. And two of the, two of the big ones seem to be the Great Famine of 1315 to 1317, and of course, the Black Death 
um, is kind of always lurking in the background of this this time and age as well. So the late Middle Ages are, are typically a, a period that are characterized by endemic warfare. Um, three major crises tend to lead to this seemingly feeling of constant warfare, demographic collapse from the Great Famine of 1315 to 17 and the Black Death. You have political uprisings uh, that are becoming very common and then religious schisms in the Catholic Church also lead to um, significant conflict or at least contribute to significant conflict. Um, armor of the late Middle Ages, plate becomes more common, especially as we move along into the 14th century. More areas of the body are covered by plates, sometimes big plates, sometimes small plates. Uh, the brigandine is a good example of this. Um, you have these, these single piece breastplates in the, in the early 15th century, like a single piece of metal covers your entire chest. Um, and then by the 1460s or 70s, you find this much more flexible garment of velvet or of uh, leather or other types of cloth and these teeny tiny plates. I mean, you know, this big that just tons of them that are stacked over each other and, and overlap almost like lamellar armor that you might find in other places of the world. Um, and it creates flexibility. It's easier to make, but it, it also protects you pretty well. Uh, one of the things it's important to recognize is that mail never stops being used. It is still a defense for areas that are difficult to cover in plate. Uh, sometimes it's a supplementary defense. Like for example, a male skirt for your upper thighs or groin area was common. Um, you might also use mail if you couldn't afford plate armor, <clears throat> even though mail was not necessarily cheap at this time. Um, it was often cheaper than plate, at least in some places at some time. Most places and most times it was cheaper. Um, shields become less common until they're not used by knights at all because they are so well armored that the shield, the shield is not necessary anymore. Um, some of your ranged troops are still using a type of shield, a particular type of shield called a pavis. Um, and then some of your infantry are still using shields also, depending on where they are in the infantry line and what their role is um, in, that, in that troop mass. Helmets are common for all types and classes of soldiers, still all seal construction. Great helms are still around. Uh, a type of, of big helm called the bassinet or the great bassinet um, is popular for the entirety of the age. It comes in in the early 1300s and lasts all the rest of the way through the late Middle Ages. And on this type of helmet, you have various types of visors. Sometimes you have an open face where there is, it would be no visor. Sometimes you have something called a pig face visor, which is that pointed nose. Uh, also, in at least in the German technology called a hound skull. Um, you have the clap visor, which is a, a kind of a, um, well, it, it's pretty much it's got a hinge at the top and it, it opens up like this. Um, it's more of a flat faced design. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of these uh, in a little bit. Other types of helmets, sallets, uh, armets, barboots, which are actually an open type of helmet with, with additional cheek protection. The kettle helm is still around. Uh, and lower, lower status variants were common um, and they usually were open faced as well. So let's kind of move into some of this. Um, armor for your torso, you're wearing arming garments. Um, this is the foundation of every piece of plate armor that you're gonna wear. The plate armor doesn't just sit there on its own, connected to itself. You have a piece of quilted cloth armor underneath um, for, your, for your chest and then also for your legs. And you have points, uh, which are, are pieces of leather or, or string or cord that help tie it down to the, to the arming garment itself. So the plate is tied to the arming garment and the arming garment is tailored to you just like the mail or sorry, like the plate is tailored to you. So you have these different pieces. Some do connect with them with each other, um, but they're all connected to arming garments at certain points. You have a breastplate and back plate to protect your torso. Um, a fold is a series of uh, long, thinner plates which uh, articulate, and they would be used to cover the groin area and sometimes the upper thighs. The gorget is a piece, or gorget is a piece that covers your neck, sometimes also your chin. Um, it, mail can also still be used. And if you're somebody who doesn't have quite that much money, you might have a padded jack or jack chains. Uh, padded jack is very similar to a gambeson, but um, is, is a little bit thicker as well. Uh, jack chains are a type of armor that have plates at the shoulder, uh, at the elbow, and then down toward the wrist, and then chains that connect each one, which um, don't provide the best protection, but it keeps you from losing a limb to uh, you know, to a sharp sword or an axe or something like that. Armor for the arms. Um, spalders are for your shoulders. The rare brace is for the top of your arm. Couteurs 
are for your elbows and the van brace is the part that is for your forearm. And once we get into the later middle ages, especially mid 13th, sorry, mid 14th century and beyond, all of those pieces are kind of one, one piece and they're all connected with each other. And then they, they go across your arm and attach. They might buckle in or they might have pins uh, that help lock them in place. Armor for the hands is called gauntlets. Armor for the legs, greaves are for your calves um, and your shins. Queases are for your thighs. And then for your feet, you have a type of armor called sabatons. Now, we're not going to go, there's a lot of data here. And when this is posted later, um, anybody that's interested, you can let me know and I'll get you access to this. Um, but there's a, a guy named Douglas Strong who um, has done, who's done an incredible um, kind of sampling of about 1,300 effigies um, across mainland Europe, uh, Central Europe, Western Europe, um, Scandinavia, England, um, all of the, you know, the British Isles, all this kind of area. And he has gone through and given us this detailed um, chart and description about what we see as we move along in time. So for example, let's just look at the leg harness here. In the early 1300s, most people, at least in effigies, and this is only effigies, um, so it's not the whole picture, but it's a decent snapshot. Most people, 90% uh, of them, had just mail as the protection for their legs in the 1300s. Um, a little less than 10% had partial legs, so they might have had mail and then supplemented with something like um, a floating knee cop or the polen that we talked about in the 13th century. But they don't include other forms of leg protection. Um, and then you have full floating legs, uh, which is a complex leg harness, which would have a thigh piece, a knee piece, uh, grease for your shin, like very few, but you know, a couple of these guys uh, early on in the 1300s uh, had that. By the time we've gone 30 years, look at the drastic change that's happened. Um, much, much less male only, uh, much more partial legs or full floating. By the time we go another 40 years to the 1380s, almost everybody has fully articulated leg armor, which means it's a comprehensive, fully covered leg. It has a cuisse for your thigh, um, a knee piece that is joined to the cuisse with articulating or moving pieces as well as greaves for your lower legs and sabatons for your feet. So we won't look at all of this or all of these pictures in, in quite as much detail, but you can kind of see he's gone through and mapped out for us as we move from the early 1300s into the 1440s, you can see a clear change, um, a clear line as things became adopted. In the high middle ages and in the Viking age, adoption of new things happened, but technology didn't seem to change quite as quickly as it did in the late Middle Ages. In this one, um, for example, in, uh, well, let's go on, let's go to, let's go here to gauntlets. Um, gauntlets show a lot of technological change even between 1300 and 1400. You know, you have lots of, lots of different types um, that come about. Um, you have lots of different uh, options for this and you can kind of see that clear delineation of when things get adopted so technology is changing faster um, the, excuse me the types of armor that's available to people is changing faster um, and people are adopting it at a faster rate um, look at all these different defenses for hips um, some some with specially uh, you know special terms or special names for for what they do um, head defenses all types of head defenses shoulder defenses, um, things just change rapidly. And so if you're interested in that, I would highly suggest that you look up his work um, on, on that because that will give you a nice, um, they'll give you a nice overview. Um, Nathan, yes. quick question. So were those, were they made these, were kind of localized, were families that they developed, they were uh, by generations that were improving or there was like everybody was, trying to improve whatever they have. I mean, was it the center centers where you can go and get the best thing or not? Yes, I would say, I would say once you get into the high middle ages, you start to get areas that, that, um, that begin to become centers for armor production. Um, and it gets really specialized once we get into the late middle ages where you have, um, even into the 16th century in the, in the English Renaissance, you have, um, you know, you have the Greenwich armorers with Henry VIII that are, uh, I mean, very specialized in certain styles and techniques. You have, 
Um, you know, some of Maximilian, we'll see some of his armor. A uh, German emperor in the 1470s and 80s who just, I mean, incredible fluting on these armors. So there is specialization. Um, there's also evidence to show that this is true for weapons, particularly with swords. There were sword specializations um, in different areas. In Central Europe, Passau um, was a um, was a known site for sword specialization as early as the uh, the kind of last quarter of the 13th century. So yes, there are areas of specializations and you almost see this rise in conjunction with guilds. As guilds become more popular and become more specialized, you see some of that same sort of thing happening. In the Viking age and in the early part of the high middle ages, um, you know, you might have some really specialized guys at a couple of places around the country um, and, and, or in the employment of, of the king, for example, or, or a really important noble. Um, and you had armorers who could make armor or weaponsmiths who were making weapons. Uh, some were really good, some weren't. Um, so it, part of that craft goes with how well they passed it on to their, their apprentices and their journeymen that were coming in behind them. Um, but then there does seem to be, especially in some of these, these areas where you start to specialize, you get very specialized centers and they just take off. Uh, what they can do is just incredible. It's a work of art. Um, not just something that you're wearing to protect your body. So something that we're seeing, something that we're seeing here um, in front of us right now uh, are some examples of padded garments. So this is a surviving 14th century um, arming garment. It's uh, from Charles Le Bois or Charles de Bois. Um, and you can see this type of, and again, I'm not a tailor, so I can't speak to this a ton, but this is called the Grand Assiette Sleeve. This keeps your arms super mobile. Look how tight the waist is right here. This is made to his exact measurements. Lots of buttons keep it held tight and close together, even buttons along the arm as well. Um, and this was something that was worn underneath his armor. Here we have examples of jack chains, um, which are worn in, com in combination with the padded jack or the thickly padded uh, quilted garment. We saw this earlier in the high middle ages. Uh, it takes on a little bit of a different flair once you get into the late Middle Ages, um, but it's still present and it's still something that's being used and it's being used as a standalone defense. Uh, this garment is definitely not standalone, it's worn under armor, but these other garments here um, are being worn, um, are being worn uh, as standalone defense. Um, here we see uh, still a combination of mail. You see we are, we're not into the stage where we have full-blown um, full-blown articulated arm armor yet. We have mail, a mail shirt that's still underneath providing protection for weak points. Um, but then we also have a defined rare brace for the upper arm and van brace for the lower arm, a couture here for the elbow and a gauntlet for the hand. And this type of armor is called splinting or splint armor. Um, you know, these are, these are long rectangular pieces of steel that are riveted to uh, a leather uh, typically leather, could be other materials as well, but a, a leather uh, piece that kind of helps it hold its shape and form um, and provides kind of a, a, a step of protection in between uh, mail and plate. And uh, a good look at some hand armor here. Um, this, uh, speaking of specialization here in the top left, you see a Milanese example um, where you have this, this integral cuff on the back of the gauntlet and it's a mitten style. And I really like this example because in the high middle ages, this is what you would have on your hands, not the plate. You would have the mail and this padded, um, you know, this, this padded uh, protection for your hand. Uh, as we moved into plate protection, plate began to cover the hands. Um, so we have another Milanese form. This may also be German and this is gonna be very late in the middle ages. Some German styles are like this as well. Um, but these are articulating plates. So not only now do you have protection for the hands and the knuckles like you have up here, this goes all the way down to your fingertips and it's articulating plates. These are mittens or, or mitt type of protection. Look at Jonathan. The, yes. Sorry, go quick, quick. It looks like a lobster, the one on yes. the left. Um, yes. um, in comparison with China or the Muslims, the Moors, how, how developed was kind of similar, not the same thing, but who were more advanced into all this thing? If we're talking specifically about plate armor, Western Europe was the most advanced of those cultures by far. 
in uh, defense, I mean, talking about defense in war, defense in fighting, wh which one were more advanced? I mean, these look great, but I don't know. It's really hard to say um, okay. because, you know, specifically when we're talking about somewhere like the Middle East uh, or India, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, places like that, the topography is so different that different types of warfare were required. Um, you, had, you had men in India wearing breastplate type armor and even mail into the 1700s um, when it had fallen out of fashion in Europe at that time. Um, but they were never wearing fully enclosed plate harness like what you see in Western Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. So if we're talking about pure technological advancement in armor alone, Western Europe, I, I would argue, is probably the most advanced. But the reason it was the most advanced was because that was the type of warfare that persisted in that geographic region. Um, you know, when we're talking about um, when we're talking about blades, I mean, most of y'all may have heard of a type of steel called Damascus steel, um, which is which is a steel of, of varying types. It has uh, you, you make patterns with it. It's very fine steel. Um, it's it's thought to, it's called Damascus steel because it's thought to come out of Damascus. Um, so that you have different centers and different cultures that are that are famed for different things um, and are are good at different things. It, in purely the context of plate armor, I would say Western Europe because that's what dictated their warfare. Yeah, especially as far as articulation comes, yeah. like they were masses. Yeah. And, and what people don't realize is that armor was just as relevant as fashion was. People would wear armor the same way they would wear uh, their their gambas, I mean, sorry, their doublets yes. or their beaches or their hats. I mean, if you had a certain type of armor, you would be looked upon a, in a certain way. And I don't think the East took it the same way as the West, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a great point because um, somebody who's wearing gauntlets like these down here on the right, you don't want to kill him. You want to ransom him. He is showing you how much money he has by what he's wearing. And the same was true across the Viking Age and the High Middle Ages. You wore your wealth even on the battlefield because it might help save your life, not only from the blows that are being dealt to you, but you might be captured and ransomed uh, because you can afford it. So um, you see some great examples here. Here on the left, we see fully articulated fingers rather than just mitts. Um, or mittens. Also, the level of detail and yes. decoration is like wow. Because yes, because it is a, it is meant just like Sergio said. It is fashion. It is a wearable work of art. It has a job um, to to try to protect you, to try to give you an advantage, to try to keep you alive. But it also is um, it's also art. Um, our our other picture of articulated finger pieces here on the top right. This actually came out of a mass grave at grave at Visby in 1361. So. Uh, you can kind of see it's it's seen uh, a little more wear and tear. It's been buried for hundreds of years, but there it is. A lot of this exists, even for the knuckles. You can just see how much it was made, to, as much as possible, to try to fit um, to try to fit the wearer. And so now we'll move on to torso protection. Um, all of these pictures here, it's kind of hard to see, but all these pictures here come from from Joe. Um, and you, all these pictures, all these live action pictures here come from Joe. And you get to see some museum pieces. Uh, this, is a, this is a type of helmet that was unique to the Joust called a frog helmet. Um, it's a very narrow slit um, and you can see how much it comes up and the vision comes out toward the top. This is to protect your eyes from, from lance splinters. If you wanna catch one of those in the face or in the eye. So this is one solid piece almost attached to the breastplate. This is to help keep you as static and rigid as possible um, when you're hit by that lance, absorb some of that blow. This would not have been seen on the battlefield. This was for tournament use only. Um, but the rest of what we're seeing here would have been used on the battlefield. Um, this, this fellow down here um, is state of the art for around 1300, that dawn of the high middle ages. He's wearing mail. He's got his cervelier. He has uh, hardened leather greaves on. Uh, the, these shin balls here, they may also be made of steel. Um, and then once we kind of move through the age, you see, you see other forms. This is uh, kind of a composite piece of armor. Um, it didn't all go together, but it's put together in a museum collection from the mid to maybe th third quarter of the 14th century. Um, so 1350, 1375, around this kind of time period. You see Burgundian armor right here uh, in the late 15th century, so late 1400s, around 1470s, and you, get, you begin to see fluting lines, which are these little raised 
ridges here in the armor. Not only do they serve to strengthen the armor, but they're also a fashion piece. Maximilian style armor. This is a salad, sometimes called a salad, um, with, a, with an independent gorget here. Um, as well, you see the fully articulated arms, the fully articulated and fluted gauntlets. This is a German style uh, fluting here. You see um, uh, these pieces here that protect, there's mail being worn underneath the arm. Um, the, these are called besigues, and they provide extra protection to weak points um, in the armor. You can see this gentleman here who's also wearing besigues and fully articulated arm harness. He has mail on the underside where he doesn't have full plate on the underside of his arms, and he's wearing a brigandine. You can see all the little um, all the little rivet heads along this garment to show you how many different little plates um, are here. And he has a, a salad for helmet. Here on the right, you have, this is very late period, and this would have been even common into the Renaissance, fully enclosed mail, except at the back of the thighs right here and in the groin. He's not wearing any mail, but he could have been wearing mail. Um, he has bear paw sabatons, which are uh, popular in England at the time, and an armet. Uh, this is an opened armet. Um, so he can breathe a little bit, but you can see the the pauldrons here and the arm uh, the arm harness is fully fully enclosed. And here on the left side, it's it's bigger uh, than it is on the right, because being used perhaps in a tournament, um, also on horseback, uh, providing a little bit more protection there. Uh, here we have more common soldiers in the high Middle Ages. Um, on the left, you can see a lot of these helmets. These are open faced helmets. Some of them look like open bassinets, particularly this guy up here and this guy down here. But then you have some helmets um, that are just bizarre. You have a kettle helmet here. This is a helmet made of scales right here. Um, these are, this is common soldiers. These are meant to depict common soldiers. And we know they're common soldiers, not only by their helmet style, by the fact that they're not wearing any, any other metal armor. They're wearing big padded uh, jacks. They're wearing gambeson style, um, style armor. Um, here to the right, again, um, every picture uh, I say every picture, uh, one, two, three, these four pictures here are from, uh, are from Joe as well. Uh, but you can see common soldiers. This is a common crossbowman uh, here in the late Middle Ages. A handgunner as well here. He's just wearing cloth armor and a helmet. Um, and then you have a, a halberdier or a pikeman who is working in combination with these guys, and he's wearing a little bit more armor. He's meant to face his guys up close. Um, we have a gentleman here who's wearing a solid breastplate but he doesn't have the full-blown male kit, he, or sorry, full-blown plate kit. He's got an open face helmet, probably telling us that he's meant to, to be working on the ground and he's got mail covering his arms or most of his arms. Um, here in the center, we have a great shot of a hundred years war archer. You can see his bow. And I love the laminated color of his bow here from the yew tree, uh, the heartwood, the dark heartwood there in the center that resists compression and the light uh, sapwood here on the outside that is bendable and allows for that compression, but he's wearing a padded jacket um, and he's got a sword. If he, once he runs out of arrows, if he's got somebody up close, he's got that sidearm to take care of himself. He's got his arrows here on the back um, that he's meant to cause uh, damage at range, if at all possible. Here in this manuscript next to him, we do see longbowmen who are firing um, and they're shooting at men in full armor, but look at the armor that they're wearing. They have helmets and they have, uh, they have gambesons. Um, down here on the left, or, or padded jacks rather, down here on the left, um, you have, uh, this is from a recreation of the Battle of Bisbee that happens annually, where reenactors come out, a lot of guys in mail, a lot of guys in helmets, shields are still common, um, you see uh, splinted armor on some legs here, and uh, various versions of the coat of plates, uh, not quite as well defined as the brigandine, but more, um, more advanced than the early coat of plates that we saw in the St. Marie statue from like the 1250s. Um, uh, are all kind of a mishmash here. And, and Bisbee in particular, the Gotlanders who made up that militia were thought to have relatively old equipment based on what they were, they were found buried in in a mass grave. So this is stuff that wouldn't have been state of the art 1361. It would have been uh, older than that. Here on the right, we have, um, we have a man who is uh, from the Hussites and he is um, bearing his flail. Buddy, I'm in the middle of something right now. I, I need to Give me one second, excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Here on the bottom right hand, we have uh, a member of the Hussites who um, often didn't fight in much armor or didn't show much armor. And here's the two-handed flail 
that is uh, that they were known to use and were illustrated to use in various manuscript examples. Uh, here uh, in this example, we see kind of the height of full plate armor um, in the 15th century. Um, well, I'll say the height. It was this was kind of the first age where it was common to have completely encompassed or enclosing armor. Here on the left, a photo from my friend Joe. Um, this is a, a guy who would have been uh, the English men at arms uh, at Agincourt, uh, fully encased. And you can see the fold that he's wearing here, those articulated plates that kind of cover his groin, a little bit of the upper thighs. We have some manuscript examples here. And then again, another example of, uh, of German style armor, particularly fluted here on the horse um, that you might have seen uh, being worn on horseback. Here is an example of some poorly um, reconstructed armor. Um, the, the harness on the left belongs to the curator of the Arms and Armor uh, Museum at the, Wall, the Wallace Collection in, um, in London. And he had this armor made by, um, by great, a great guy, uh, maybe even a couple of great guys, I'm not exactly sure, but you can see how it's tailor-made to fit him and then here we have someone else who's reproduced that armor. And can you see the difference between something that is tailor-made to suit you and something that is not? Um, if this is the kind of armor that you're wearing on the battlefield, you're gonna get yourself killed pretty quickly because it doesn't allow you to move. It just doesn't work. Um, Sergio, I can see you smiling here. Um, because you can just see the difference, even, even to an untrained eye, if you haven't looked at this, you can see the drastic difference, particularly in the legs and the feet, the elbows, the hands. I mean, it's just, it's not even close. So you want to be sure um, that you have something that's designed for you. Here's another kind of example of that. Here's the, um, that kind of mid 14th century example we, sh we showed earlier, a little bit of Franken armor here, pieces that weren't necessarily made to go together, but are together, I think. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's right. Um, and, then an, and then another semi-reproduction that is, is just not helping anybody, um, particularly the tops of the queases right here. You couldn't bend over more than about 15 degrees before that's digging into your stomach and is no help to you at all. Um, it, it, you can just see the difference. So I wanted to include these. Obviously, I never I don't want to make fun of anybody or say anybody's work is not important or good, um, but you can see the difference with something that is very tailor-made to an individual's body versus something that isn't. Um, talking about weaponry in the late Middle Ages, the lance is still the primary weapon of the knightly charge, and I'm gonna hurry through here quickly. Um, oak shot blades are, are moving along in their typology. 13 is still around um, in the early 14th century, on up through types 22. Pole weapons begin to appear, different variations of them. Daggers are almost universal, and they are meant for stabbing at those gaps in the armor ranged weapons are around. So here's some examples of daggers in museums. You have the Bollock dagger, uh, which is essentially just a, a phallus uh, with a blade on it. Um, it, became, it became something that was almost, the arms and armor historians anyway that, that talk about this will say that it's hard to determine um, why this came about. Was it an earthy sense of humor, kind of a crude joke? Uh, or was it something that just developed and somebody said, hey, it works, let's go with it. So the Bollock dagger, uh, was, a, was a very popular type of dagger in the 14th century. You also get rondel daggers, uh, like this type down here, where you have two plates, um, and then just a hand grip in the middle uh, as well. You get quill and daggers are still around um, as well. And let's see, I'll be sure. Rondels, be sure I hit everything. Basilards are still around. Oh yeah, the, the Orea dagger, uh, Orea dagger, Oreas daggers um sorry that are right here um so-called because they look like ears um again this is very late middle ages this is like 14 maybe 1480s and a little beyond beyond into the renaissance um and mostly popular in it italy um here's some swords that were common or types of swords that were common in the high middle ages um you begin to get more two-handed blades you eventually end up with things called zweihanders which are specialized two-handed swords some of which were very tall uh, six, six, six and a half feet, maybe. Um, you get pole arms. And pole arms are really important because this, this is the type of weapon that takes on plate armor. Here on the left, we have an, a classic example from the Wallace collection of a pole axe, which is an axe blade on one side, a hammer face on the other side, and then you have uh, kind of that, that stabbing spear point on top. 
Um, so this, this is a weapon that can cut, crust, cut, excuse me, cut, thrust, or crush. Um, and if I've got, you know, this, the back of this hammer, you can kind of see a little bit in the detail. It's almost like a meat tenderizer. Um, it, it will crush and dent and break plate armor um, if the blow is delivered correctly. So this is, this is the type of thing that I use against somebody in full plate armor. Halberds here in the middle start to show up in the early 14th century, become much more common in the mid 14th century. Um, these are axe blades um, that have different facets as well. You have a, the blade for cutting, you have a piercing side, a stabbing side. Um, this piercing hook also could be used to pull somebody off of horseback out of their saddle. Um, and these were often long, around six to eight feet. Um, and they could be used up at the front ranks of infantry work, or perhaps even two or three ranks back, depending on your formation. Uh, and they, they would be very helpful. You have a bardiche here on the right-hand side. It's a shorter, a shorter half, but a dedicated cutting ax. Uh, popular in Eastern Europe, some in Central Europe, a little bit in Western Europe also. It was known across the age, but uh, much more so in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is the English type of bill or a bill hook, which originally was um, kind of a landscaping tool for, for cutting hedges and branches, uh, and it became popular. Um, again, kind of like the halberds, you have a, a stabbing uh, ability, a cutting ability, a piercing or a hooking ability to pull folks down. Uh, hammers became popular, um, and then with these types of, particularly these types of spikes on the back called uh, beaks or the bec de corban, uh, like a crow's beak. Um, you, you begin to have multi-purpose and function weapons to try to deal with armor. Here in the middle, literally just a two-faced hammer um, with a stabbing point. Uh, you have glaives, uh, particularly here in the middle, which are almost like knives on the end of a, of a spear. So you get the action of a spear and the cutting action of, of a bladed weapon of that type, um, which were also common. Oops. And then some of our ranged weapons. Um, this photo here comes from a gentleman named Will Sherman who uh, makes medieval arrows and he makes them with a medieval recipe. Uh, they are swan or goose feathers with, and these in particular swan or goose with red silk and copper verdigris uh, with a wax mixture in the, in the middle there to try to hold and bind everything in place as much as possible. Um, you, see, you see a crossbow here with crossbow bolts. Um, they're much shorter. Oftentimes they had wooden fletchings, may also have had other types. Um, and as armor became more of a thing, you had to have thicker arrows, you had to have higher poundage in your bows. Um, you see these bows here from the Mary Rose. So these are actually post, um, these are post our time period, but it's believed that they would have existed in that period as well. So these are surviving bows from the Mary Rose shipwreck of Henry VIII, uh, one of his fleets. Um, and these big bows, archers oftentimes in movies are shown as, as wimps, but um, some of these bows found at the Mary Rose had draw weights of up to 180 pounds. And so to be able to draw that back, um, you have to have some serious muscle. So much so that in graves of known archers, um, they can tell whether they were right or left-handed because the bone structure, let's say they were right-handed, the bone structure on their drawing arm um, is bigger. They can see where there was more muscular attachment. It was actually like one side of their body was even more built, at least their chest and and, and arm was more built up or could have been more built up than the other side. There's evidence to show that. Um, your crossbows to keep up with the longbow begin moving towards steel prods, um, which means it requires, so they can, they can throw in a bolt at higher poundage, you know, greater speed, greater inertia, um, but they're harder to draw back. And so you end up with a windlass type device where you actually crank a gear um, to pull back your string in order to get the higher poundage that you need. Um, you also have a Kranikin bow here, which is a type of device. It's similar to the windlass, but it's a flat, um, it's a flat crank and it's a little bit easier to turn. Here is a, a sampling of some of the, the arrowheads that have survived. Um, some, particularly these here in the middle are needle bodkins and they're designed to pierce armor. Um, these, these are not piercing plate armor, unless it's very poorly made plate armor. Um, there, it may have punched through plate armor. It may not have um, if it was poorly made, well-made, well-shaped. And if you remember back to the plate armor we just looked at, your, bre your breastplates aren't flat. They're, they're globose or they are um, curved in shape and they are meant to deflect and good armor deflects arrows, even from high poundage bows. Um, into the Renaissance, good armor deflects bullets. 
um, if it's made well and, and made it to the right, um, to right specifications. So where you get people dying from arrows are where it hits gaps and there's mail, which might be less protective against a very high poundage bow with, a, um, with an arrow of this type. Um, or where there's gaps in your armor and that hits, or where there's a rain of arrow, of arrow fire that you just, you know, when you have 3,000 arrows coming in your general direction at once, um, you're going you're gonna to get hit somewhere and it's going gonna, it's gonna to incapacitate you or kill you um, just, just from that sheer fact alone. And here on the top left, we have surviving handguns. Um, interestingly, the barrel of a gun is called a barrel because when these were first made, they were made by barrel makers. Uh, there were the steel, um, our steel casting and forging technology um, wasn't enough to handle the highest, it could have handled lower in, lower end gunpowder shots, but some of the higher end powdered, gunpowder shots, there wasn't technology to make a solid steel barrel that worked the way that they wanted. So it was made like a barrel was made and then bound together with iron strips um, for reinforcement. So um, here's a handgun and here it is inside its stock. Um, that you can kind of see there in that museum photo. Now, very quickly, moving on to timelines of weapons. Um, the sword timeline, generally speaking, swords move from cutting blades to thrusting blades and then back to cut and thrust. And then I'll minimize this. So this is Oakshot's typology, the type 10 over here at the, in the Viking age. Um, you can kind of see that dedicated cutter. And as we begin to move across this timeline, we get into cut and thrust blades and then we get into blades that are solely designed for thrusting right here. You can cut with them, but look, look at their cross section. They're designed to thrust and eventually back into blades when we, when we get towards the end of the Middle Ages and you're, um, you know, you're having common guys still with less armor, um, cutting blades kind of come back in a little bit. So you, you see this kind of progression in those blades and their design and style. Um, this is a photo again from my friend Joe, and this was taken at an event, and on the right you have the Roman gladius from around first century AD, and you can kind of see the development of the sword in the Roman area, or the Roman era here in the first three swords, uh, from the gladius to the spatha, um, and then you have a, a early Middle Ages around sixth, seventh century type blade here, into Viking blades here, um, and then onto the sword of the high Middle Ages, uh, right there on the far left, that's a, a type 12, oak shot type 12. Um, here are some surviving uh, examples for more of our late Middle Ages blades. Um, you can see they're all two-handed. They're designed to be used two-handed. Uh, these are thrusting blades. Sometimes you would do something called half sorting, uh, where you would hold at the, the handle and then you would grip onto the, the blade itself and you give you more control over the tip of the blade and you try to hit gaps in the armor uh, based on use of that kind. Axes across the age. The forms really don't change that much apart from adding additional weapon faces or elements on pole axes. Um, this first example here is from the 11th century. This example to the right is believed to be from the 12th century held in private collection. An uh, interesting little curly cue there on top. Um, this is a 13th century example here um, that I believe is held in the Danish National Museum. And then of course the pole axe that we've seen uh, from the Wallace collection there. You can kind of see there's not much change in that until you begin to add uh, elements on uh, for, for extra work. Uh, with blunt weapons, as armor progresses, blunt weapons evolve uh, to deal directly with plate armor. Here on the top left, you see a mace and a club that are being wielded by, um, by guys on the Bayou Tapestry. So again, those kind of blunt weapons, uh, you know, that are right there. These examples are from the National, to the right, are from the National Museum of Ireland, and they are 13th century examples. Um, again, kind of that cast bronze. We begin to see flange maces in the early 14th century. This is from England. Um, and then here, some of the examples from the high Middle Ages. Again, we see the hammer faces, the bec de corban, uh, the beaks on the back end, uh, stabbing points on top, full-blown hammer faces and stabbing points. And then the uh, final evolution of the flanged mace here and all of that, and this is late 15th century, so late 1400s, and all of the percussive energy is delivered right at the point of these steel uh, spokes there. Um, these to the right are actually trench clubs from World War I. These were used by Austrian troops um, in, in the battles that they had in early 1914 and 1915. And it is remarkable to me 
uh, how much they look like uh, maces from the Middle Ages. So this design, even into the 20th century, really does not change that much. Uh, moving on into daggers, uh, it's universally used as a stabbing weapon um, across all the ages. Um, I mean, it can cut as well, but you begin to see more of that focus toward thrusting. Um, some are more slender, some, um, some are a little bit more stout. Here on the top left is an example of a quillen dagger from uh, the British National Museum. You see antennae type examples here to the right. This is a Basilar dagger from the 14th century. It's German origin, much more of that triangular shaped blade. Um, another Basilar, this is an English Basilar that was also popular in Italy uh, that has a very characteristic I-shaped handle. Um, a Bollock dagger here in the center on the bottom and then a Rondel dagger. Again, called so because of these rondels at the guard and at the base plate of the dagger. Moving on into pole weapons, uh, the spear, of, of course, was the first pole weapon. Other variants did flourish, remained popular, um, even into the Renaissance. We kind of see here to the left some Viking spears. Um, these are examples from the late 13th century, maybe mid to late 13th century. We see spears. We see an early version of a bardiche or a halberd. Uh, uh, this would be more of a halberd on a long pole. Not only do we have an axe blade, but it extends down and attaches further even down the haft. Uh, here we have an example of a golden dog, which was the weapon that um, beat back the, the French knights at Courtrai in 1302. Uh, thrusting weapon, also a blunt trauma weapon uh, with this clubbed head right here and then the point. Um, and then here we have various versions of halberds. Uh, this example um, has a unique faceted hammer with points. Um, some, some modern reproducers make examples of this. Another example here of the bill hook, which was, which was popular. And then some Zweihenders, um, the big two-handed swords that were developed um, and were even popular into the 16th century to deal with uh, pole arms in particular. Uh, in ranged weapons, um, we again see some more arrow types here. Um, here's an example of the stirrup loading crossbow that I had earlier, you can see. Um, this guy is wearing a, uh, a device around his belt that is hooked, um, which allows him to hook that into the string. So when he pushes down with his foot and stands back uh, with, his, with his chest and back muscles, it lengthens the span of the bow and hooks on. Um, we have an archer here um, in the 15th century. Um, and then more of our handgun weapons, handguns from behind a pavise shield here. Um, which you can see some of that action going off, pretty cool gunpowder weapons, and then a cannon weapon here. Again, another picture of the, the range guy that we've seen. And then for our last uh, slide here, we can see an armor timeline that we'll move through pretty quickly. Shields and helmets um, only in the, very, in the early Viking age onto plate um, by the end. And uh, lower class or less wealthy individuals may do the best that they could with what they had. All of these live photos here, again, are courtesy of uh, Joe and Ian. Um, and then here on the top, you see uh, Vikings moving across the Viking Age, where it's just helmets, shields, axes, and spears are popular. This is a Norman uh, soldier here uh, with more mail. He's got the, the kind of nasal helmet that has become popular and a kite shield. Uh, we have Knights of the High Middle Ages here. Uh, and again, I included this photo so you could see, um, see on horseback. And this, these photos actually come from, from Andrew Dangle. Um, who kindly allowed us to use them for this, uh, for this event. Um, and you can kind of see the knight of the high middle ages in his context on horseback. Turn of the 13th century right here um, and turn of the 15th century right here. So hundred years apart. Um, and you can see how much has actually changed. And then as we move lastly into the end of the 15th century, we see um, male or not male, excuse me, plate that encloses the entirety of the body. And then these last two shots are armors from Henry VIII in the early 16th century, but I just wanted to throw them in there to show you as we move across that every single part of the, by this time, every single part of the body was enclosed um, in plate armor. With shields, we start with the Viking round shield here on the left, and you can kind of see this transition towards, um, you know, longer shields. This is, this is kind of in between the kite shield and the, um, and the heater shield, which is this triangular version here, um, and they get smaller and smaller until they go away. And then they come back for crossbowmen and handgunners and other infantry types with the pavise, which is this large shield that just stands on the ground. 
something that you saw with the handgunner standing behind earlier in that photo, and then a specialized tournament shield here for use with Lance. Um, and then for armor, for our common soldiers, we see uh, somebody around turn of the 12th century here, so around 1100, uh, with his kite type shield. He's only wearing padded armor. He's got a spear and a helmet, and he's ready to go. You have a handgunner, um, a crossbowman, another handgunner here wearing very padded armor and a breastplate. Uh, and this type of helmet is the barboot helmet. That is that open-faced uh, style of helmet that I mentioned earlier. And then here again, um, this is an armor timeline, and this is courtesy of Joe. And it um, shows you in one photo the kind of move from the Viking Age all the way up to about 1470s or 1480s here on the right. And you can see that change just encompass uh, as it moves across. And the very interesting thing to notice is that there's a lot of time, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of time between most of these individuals. Uh, the two guys here on the left could have, they, they were existing, coexisting. They would have, they would have existed on the same day at the Battle of Hastings, a Norman and an Anglo-Saxon Huscarl here. Um, they were on the same field at the same time. But this gentleman to the right would have been 60 years removed from this guy. And he's 100 years removed from him. So, you know, it's like your grandfather or your great grandfather would have been on the battlefield before you get to the next individual down the line. Almost none of them, other than the two guys on the left, none of these guys would have seen each other on the battlefield together. Um, you don't have guys just running around in mail because. I didn't want to go with plate. It, you went with the best that you could afford in the later Middle Ages. Um, it was definitely, uh, definitely plate. Um, and so that brings us back to the end uh, where we, where we are, are done. Um, thank you for this opportunity. If there are any questions you have or, or things that I can answer for you, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, this was amazing, Jonathan. Wow. I mean, it just went in one breath. I really loved it. Thank you so much. You know, this looks like you put, you know, blew a lot of work into it as well. Well, thank I you really for the opportunity. This is something fun to talk about and uh, kind of helps put things in context for us as we study the rest of the history around uh, around the the warfare and the battle. So, yeah, no, this was this was uh, this was I mean, very concise, very uh, everything you know to a point and. Um, explanations you know through different armor and armory which for me medieval time i mean they call it dark ages but look how much stuff they have it's yeah. crazy whoever told them dark ages is is not really an educated or maybe uh, uh an ignorant brute because this is this takes sophistication i agree very you know? very much a misnomer yeah then we they're, they're starting to reconsider that term dark ages yeah. i don't think yeah. that's like the right way to label it it's just it's just another period of history after the roman empire you know right. Basically, uh, but I have a question regarding the Byzantium Empire. As you know, you know, even though it was considered, you know, Roman Empire, but they, you know, they all spoke Greek, and most of the population was Greek. Yes. And, you know, uh, you said that there was skirmishes in the West, but what about Roman Empire? Was you know, I mean, the the Byzantium was, you know likely the descent i mean they were they were the roman empire they had you know yeah. much more armor they had legions did they when they clashed i mean were they in the beginning they probably were completely right you know uh routing the westerners like there was no tomorrow it depends uh, you know it depends on the age that we're talking about and they didn't clash a whole lot they did clash a couple of times and that's not that's not something i'm particularly well versed in but um the Byzantine Empire was, um, you know, they had they had different sets of armor and different types of things. They had some of the stuff that the West had, and they had their own versions as well. But kind of starting after Alexis Komnenos, they begin this long decline, uh, eventually towards, um, you know, towards towards 1451, and um, their dealings with the West are much more about trying to encourage the West on crusade as a shield against. Um, advancing forces from the east. So they had their own armies, um, but they were on a slow decline. They didn't do a they, they didn't do a lot of attacking and a lot of holding of new a lot of a lot of new ground acquisition of new ground. Uh, it was more holding ground, um, and part of that is the political you know stuff that was surrounding the Byz Byzantine Empire at this time. But in the um, in the very early Middle Ages, particularly from you know around sixth century and on into the 10th, 11th century, 
they were the dominant force in Europe. Um, they were the Far East, but they Far East of Europe anyway. But they were they were they were very dominant um, and very skilled. I appreciate that. Yeah, there was a, just you know it's definitely important perspective because when you, you mentioned Varangians, who were the yes. guard of the empire, this is what Russians used to call the Viking settlers in yes. Rus, Varangi. Uh I mean, the, the Russian word is Baryagi. Which means the uh, <laughs> which means the um, you know Norwegian and Swedish Vikings coming to Russia and yeah. you know uh, and that's what they call them. It's it's interesting the uh, the the word is it has traveled. So I, as a kid, I learned it at, you know in school. Very cool. Yeah, you know, no, I appreciate it. This was amazing. So much thank you and thank, thank you your wife the, the fact that she's going to be doing medieval you know uh, music yes, in uh, five sixteen. Yeah. Hope you guys have a nice uh, wherever you guys go. Um, you know, in this not easy times. I mean, yes. obviously, any kind of breathe you're gonna get. And good luck for your studies. And you know, hope uh, you do one more like this. You know, when you're free. I mean, obviously, you have your thing going on. I understand that. You know. Well, and, I'm uh, I'm just grateful. Thank know, you for the time and for everybody who is willing to come and listen and uh, and kind of join with us in on this. So thank you. All right. Have a nice rest of the Sunday, my friend. Thank you. Hey, so you much. as well. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Goodbye.